Howdy, folks. Uh, we just opened up the waiting room for the Getting Started with Quarter workshop here at RM Medicine. Uh, so I'm going to give folks a little bit of time to roll in, and then we'll get started in just a few minutes. Um, if you have already joined and you're here watching, we uh, are going to be working off some slides and public material that I've already put up on the internet, so you can access it or uh, today as well as in the future. So I'm going to drop uh, some information into the chat window. So slides slash content. That link I just shared is going to be the primary uh, web page that has essentially everything you would need. You know, it has the content, it has the slides, it has links out to workshop material, as well as to a pre-populated RStudio Cloud instance. So I'll give a couple of reminders for that because we're going to have some people that join and not necessarily right at the first second, but join a few minutes late. And we'll get kicked off here in just a few minutes. The way that they've set up the workshops is that uh, it's muted for everyone and video off for everyone. But if you do have questions, please feel free to put uh, those into the chat box. Some of those I'm going to aggregate and answer at the end or at the end of each section. And some of those I might address in the moment, depending upon uh, kind of what the question is and, and the content in it. I will keep the chat open off to the side so I can make sure to stay ahead of questions. For folks that are in the room, just to confirm that you can uh, type in the chat box, does someone mind saying hello or asking a question real quick? Nothing uh, particular, but just anything in the chat box there. Awesome. There's a lot of people. Hello, folks. How are y'all? Fantastic. Great. So yes, uh, I know Cordo is, is something that's new to a lot of folks. It's been out for a little bit of time, but uh, as you have questions, please feel free to, to ask them in the chat. Um, and again, I'll do my best to answer them and stick around for a little bit. Um, and if there's some that are kind of out of scope for today, we might address them in a different way, but a lot of content to cover. But thank you all very much for the uh, hellos there. All right, I'm gonna drop another link to the slides and content. Question from Atu. Yes, you can sign up at quartopub.com for a free um, free Quartopub handle. So you can imagine like signing up for it and then you can publish there um, from our studio or from the Quarto command line interface for publishing content there. All right, we're gonna give it about uh, one more minute and then we'll get kicked off. Again, for anyone that's joining right now, um, the slides that I'm posting into the chat box, they have all the content for today. We'll be working through four main sections, intro to Cordo, authoring Cordo, plots and tables, and then static documents. Um, I've you know prepared some material for y'all. Uh, number one, if you did want to uh, install our studio, the latest version that comes with Cordo and you're essentially ready to go. Uh, or if you want to visit the workshop material after the fact, I've put that up on GitHub uh, at my handle slash Quarto dash workshop. And then also have a pre-populated RStudio Cloud instance um, where you can go and access it. There will be some copy breaks uh, or, or bio breaks during the workshop. We've got about three and a half hours of uh, time together. And I imagine we'll have a, a couple breaks in between sections for each of those. With that, we're at the 2.34 or 2.35 p.m. local for me. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the content and we'll get started. I'll paste this one more time. So slides, um, interesting. Okay, yeah, so if you're not able to access the slides on GitHub, sorry about that. Um, I can try and upload a PDF uh, copy as well for, for the future, but those are hosted on, on GitHub. So possible that y'all are blocking there. 
um, for today. Again, this website has the links out to everything. And if you were to click on the GitHub logo here in the top right, um, you can go to the actual source code. And that has, again, links to the workshop materials, installation of our studio, our studio cloud, as well as taking you back to uh, the RN Medicine homepage itself. For each of the slides we're going to be working on, we're going to go here on the left or click on the slides button and get to the same content. And those are the four sets of slides for today. I have pre-populated RStudio Cloud with workshop materials, so we can actually go through some of those. Because we have such a large number of participants and because we're fully virtual, I've really set this up as more of like a uh, I do, we do in terms of like, I will show you kind of what the purpose of that little workshop material is. Um, and then after the fact as well, you can go in and play with the code. So today is gonna be a lot of kind of uh, slides obviously, but then some hands-on material that I'll show and then swapping back and forth between those. So let's get kicked off. We're gonna go to intro to Quarto and getting started with that. So very nice to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Mock. I work at our studio. Uh, I was the Quarto project manager uh, leading up to our studio conf and also work as a customer enablement lead uh, here at our studio. So helping a lot of our customers and open source users uh, get really good value out of our open source and professional products. For today, we're gonna be talking a lot about Quarto. So hello, Quarto. Hopefully you're in the right workshop and this is what you're here to, to learn about. And we're gonna be covering uh, a lot of what Quarto is, how it's a little bit different from things like Jupyter or Markdown and some of the new syntax that you can use with it. Throughout this workshop, feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat. Some of those, again, I will address live. Um, many of them I might save till the end of a section uh, closer to when we're taking breaks or, or kind of in between the different presentations. So for the assumptions for today, uh, my hope is that you know a little bit about R, you might even know a little bit about Markdown, but ultimately you wanna learn about Quarto, which is the next generation of R Markdown. So we'll teach you, you know, Quarto syntax and formats, more Markdown and how to use it inside our studio and elsewhere, and a little bit of R along the way. The focus of today though, is not necessarily learning all of the intricacies of R, it's more about applying skill sets that you already have or learn inside R uh, for, for Quarto. Again, my name is Thomas Mock. If you do have questions after the fact, um, there's uh, my Twitter handle or GitHub with all of my content at, at jthomasmock or my personal blog written in Quarto uh, at themockup.blog. So we'll, we'll cover all of these different things and feel free to reach out after the fact as well. Again, for today's workshop materials, um, there's a couple ways to get here. If you just navigate to uh, the link, and again, I'll drop it into the chat box really quick. There we go. Um, that has all the slides and materials. And then I have a separate section for the two-day workshop I taught at our studio conf. Obviously that's 16 hours of content, which is too much to fit in today, but just so you have access to it. And then on our studio cloud, I have all of the workshop materials that we use for those two days. And you can play around with it interactively without having to install anything. If you wanna use Quarto locally, really the, the answer there is install the latest version of our studio. So that's version 2022.07.1. That's the latest version that came out around the same time as our studio conf. And it comes pre-installed with Quarto. So you can essentially get started and, and get going straight out of the box. There's a couple packages. If you did wanna go through all of the material, you could install these packages and be ready to go. But again, if you use our Studio Cloud, uh, the environment is already set up for you and you can use that for free. I'm gonna copy the link to our Studio Cloud into the chat as well. Um, again, that is gonna be open forever. You can sign up for free and have a kind of a, a weekly or monthly um, bandwidth that you can use there, or you can use that content locally by pulling it off of uh, GitHub as well. So now that we've covered a couple of the different resources in terms of the slides are here, the slides are also linked at the bottom of every single slide. So if you get lost, you can always go back to the homepage and then some links out to packages and other pieces of content that we'll be using today. So 
if you kind of wanted to get started and you were doing this after the fact, again, install our studio and I've got a link out to the latest version. And then you can clone this specific repository to get all of the workshop materials or use our studio cloud for free um, up to a certain amount of hours per month and use the workshop materials there. Getting into our actual presentation on Cordo, Cordo itself is an open source scientific and technical publishing system built on Pandoc. So this allows you to weave together text and code and produce essentially elegantly formatted outputs, things like documents or web pages, blog posts, books, and all sorts of other pieces of content. As far as what this means in action, um, you may have heard the term Pandoc before, maybe you've used it, or you might have realized that Pandoc also powers things like our markdown. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the mental model of how our markdown works and then compare that a bit more to, to Quarto so you can help differentiate between the two products. So number one, Quarto, uh, Knitter and our markdown, those uh, our packages have been around for a little over a decade or almost a decade for our markdown. And they've been very productive in terms of lots of people got great value out of them, lots of people use them, and we're going to continue to support and maintain our markdown and knitter moving forward. If we look at a technical diagram of how our markdown works, you have a plain text uh, R markdown or .rmd file. In that document, you would write some text, you write some R code or other language code. And then you would pass that along to Knitter to actually evaluate the R code. This will generate an intermediary markdown file that also includes the text you've written in your R markdown document. And then that is passed to Pandoc, which actually does the conversion over to say like a report or a presentation or a project that you would then display and share with your users or other stakeholders. The important part to realize, though, is that uh, our markdown, the R package, as opposed to the .rmd format, actually did some pre-processing and post-processing of the content. So there was literal R code that uh, basically changed how the document worked based upon which R markdown package you were using. So things like blog down and book down and page down, in addition to the core R markdown package, each of them had kind of their own syntax and their own little extras that they did by adding on additional R packages. And because our Markdown kind of grew as kind of a separate ecosystem over this long period of time, there wasn't always this shared syntax across them. Now, when we talk about Quarto, the diagram actually looks really similar, but it's more than just Knitter or more than just our Markdown. So this diagram might look almost identical to what we saw before. The main thing to notice is that we now have a .qmd instead of an .rmd, so a Quarto markdown document as opposed to a pure R markdown document. We're still using Knitter as our engine to execute R code. We're still generating that intermediary markdown file. But now we have this Pandoc with Lua filters that's at the stage of conversion. So rather than having literal R code that varies between all the different packages, Quarto actually bundles all of the pre-processing into the Quarto command line interface and actually does the conversion directly with Pandoc through what are called Lua filters or extensions to Pandoc. So this means that while you can continue using R, you can also in the future have documents where you can actually write you know, entire Quarto presentations that have no code in them. And you wouldn't even have to have R installed on your system. So you can imagine a future where your non-technical colleagues or your domain experts you're working with don't even have to install R to collaborate with you on Quarto documents. They would just see it as writing another page or writing another report or presentation or project. But for y'all who actually have some experience with R or at least gaining experience there, um, y'all can embed uh, R and other data science languages into your Quarto documents and again, create reports and presentations and projects and other uh, formats. Now, the next stage is that while this is you know, very similar to what we did before, we're also opening up the um, population of people that might want to use Quarto. So you might imagine if you have colleagues using Python or using Julia, and that's something that they really enjoy using, it's kind of hard sometimes to motivate them to use things like reticulate to wrap their Python code or to wrap their Julia code in R just to execute their documents. So Quarto also provides other language engines. 
So still using a Cordo markdown document, still using Cordo with these, you know, extensions to Pandoc with Lua filters. But now we're replacing a knitter with a Jupyter kernel or Jupyter as the engine. And this allows Cordo to execute native Python or native Julia code in addition to other languages and still use them with the exact same syntax as what you'd be doing with R. So essentially with the knowledge that you've learned with uh, R and R Markdown and Knitter, they can be applied across other different languages or in collaboration with colleagues using things like Julia. So a lot of power here in terms of going more than just one language, thinking of like overall, what are the different languages you can bring into your computational documents? For other colleagues that you work with, they may not even want to use a plain text format like QMDs. So they can actually use Jupyter or IPython notebooks as the actual uh, kind of interface that they're writing their Cordo documents in. But Cordo can still convert that notebook over to the exact same formats or presentations or whatever else you're creating. So however you're collaborating with your colleagues in whatever language y'all are using, uh, y'all can still use a shared syntax and format that you're working across all of those four. So a very exciting times in my, in my opinion. So if we think about this, kind of moving away from our diagrams, uh, talking more about the internals, Cordo is using an engine like Knitter or Jupyter kernels to execute the code, and that generates the temporary markdown file. The markdown file is processed by Pandoc and Cordo's specific Lua filters, along with some CSS for HTML or custom LaTeX for PDF, and then it's converted to the final output format. Importantly, while you might hear different languages throughout this presentation, Lua filters basically are language agnostic. So you can imagine that stuff we're writing today applies to any language. And if there's other developers that contribute to Corto or write extensions to Corto, it doesn't really matter what language they wrote in. So you could have someone who wrote an extension that they're coming from the Julia world, but they're using Lua filters. So it still works for R and still works for Python. Basically there's this interchange between all the languages. It's not specific to just one. So this is again, really useful where for collaboration or for shared syntax across all these different ecosystems. Cordo can also support things like HTML widgets. So if you have interactivity and you wanna have, you know, uh, graphics or, you know, images or tables that are reactive, you can have those with HTML widgets in R or what are called Jupyter widgets for Python and Julia through the Jupyter uh, extension. Cordo also comes with native support for JavaScript or what's called observable JavaScript, which is essentially like a package or enhancements to vanilla JavaScript from the same group that put together D3 for, for graphics in JavaScript. Um, Observable is really cool, and it's going to feel, you know, similar to things like ggplot because it's using a grammar of graphics. And again, while you don't have to use it, it's something you can pull on and bring onto the table when you need to. So if we look at some observable JavaScript, you might have a presentation and it has like a little widget here. So with this widget, I can say, well, in Texas, it's about 91 degrees right now, which is 33 degrees Celsius for my friends across the pond. Or maybe they're saying, well, it's 23 degrees Celsius, and this is about 73.4 degrees Fahrenheit here in the US. So you can write these by uh, custom kind of extensions or, or JavaScript that you're adding. And for most of it, it's going to feel very similar to basic Shiny code. So creating this view up here is done with what's called inputs.range. And you can say, you know, 0 to 100. And step by 1, the default value is 34. And then I'm using some HTML strings to say, like, add the degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit, but you don't have to use things like that. So I do a default to 34 in this example. So again, you can pass data back and forth between R, Python, Julia into JavaScript and back. So you can have client-side interactivity and do some really cool and complex things without having to go only to Shiny or only to things like Dash or Streamlit and Python but you can still extend them with other languages and other uh, server-side activity as well. Now, where Observable really shines is like, there's actually this context of building widgets together. So here I have uh, you know, a slider and I can adjust that and it will actually affect the graphic itself rather than just raw data. And it will also apply to tables and other different components I'm putting together. So whether you're building small UI components in a report or even interactive graphics, uh, these can be written uh, with, with JavaScript and with Observable, in addition to the R code and other things you're writing. 
So overall, I hope this kind of gives you a brief overview that Cordo is a big universe. You know, obviously we're loving and it kind of adding a lot of features for our core R users. But we're also adding, you know, JavaScript in the equation with observable JavaScript and giving support for Python and Julia for a lot of your collaborations that you might do or stick with one language. Maybe you're staying only with R and not touching the other things, which is also fine. Altogether, this gives us Cordo, which can then convert all of our different source code and markdown into complex, all sorts of beautiful documents, whether it's HTML or Word or Office or PDFs or presentations like the Cordo presentation I have for you today. As far as what Cordo actually is and how we get around this ability to not have to rely on using a specific language like R or Python, but applying to everything, Cordo itself is a command line interface or it's called a CLI. And this is what actually does your conversion. It's wrapping Pandoc and it takes things like QMDs or RMDs or IPython notebooks and then converts them over. If I were to go to my terminal and call Cordo dash dash help, it would give me this little help page that you see here where it says, you know, version 1.0.36. Um, and then it gives me a few different commands. Like to actually get to the help, you can use dash dash help, or you can use things like render or preview to convert your documents between formats or to maintain a little server. So as you save and make changes to your document, they show up in real time. So while this might seem quite different than how you would use our markdown, uh, it's still very much a code-based approach. And our studio, especially the editor, uh, has a lot of features built in. So you can essentially use the exact same workflows as you would with our markdown, but you can always escape out to the command line interface or the CLI if you want to use that. Speaking of different interfaces, there's obviously the comfort of where you want to work in the workspace that you want to use. So obviously our studio, we've got extremely deep integration, even to the fact that uh, our studio actually bundles Quarto. So if you install the latest version, Quarto is just there and available. It's already installed. We have things like the render button or the publish button, as well as like the familiar interface of like the R Markdown experience, but now we're using Quarto. You can still generate and preview your documents in the viewer pane and uh, other kind of different formats like presentations and websites can also be built into the RStudio workspace. But again, we're opening it up to additional users. So maybe you have colleagues that are using Jupyter Notebooks, or maybe you yourself like using Jupyter Notebooks for things like Julia. Um, you can write that code, whether it's Python or Julia or whatever else in Jupyter Notebooks, and again, render out the exact same type of documents using the command line interface. And then lastly, we've also released a uh, VS Code extension. So for folks using VS Code as their primary editor or one that they're switching in and out of, uh, you get a rich experience with that as well, with the ability to like run interactive cells as well as uh, generate the actual documents out. So again, rather than uh, talking to colleagues you're collaborating with and having to standardize around one tool or one IDE, you can each use your platforms that you're uh, you know, appreciating and that you like and collaborate across them and use them all together. For our studio, it goes uh, even further because the integrations that we do, we control like the full stack so we can go as deep as we want with those integrations. It also brings in, in what is called the visual editor mode. This allows you to see the literal uh, markdown converted into the final format without having to render out your whole document. So here at the top of the bar, and it might be a little bit small, so let me zoom in a little bit. You can see there's this button between source and visual. By clicking on those, I'm able to switch back and forth from the source mode or the literal plain text and the visual mode, which gives me the ability to actually see headers as, as big headers and links as links and so forth. It also brings in a couple word processor things in terms of there's little buttons for bolding text, italicizing, changing header levels, adding links and tables. And you can do all of this interactively and it will show on the page as well as inject the code uh, in plain text that you can switch over to in your final version. So the visual editor mode just allows you to be more productive when you're writing documents or writing computational documents inside RStudio. I'm going to show you a little bit of how that works, and we're going to open up the Quarto workshop materials. Again, if I wanted to go to those, I could use them locally and have cloned it from GitHub, or I can go to RStudio Cloud and open up this specific environment. 
So again, that our Studio Cloud link is here. We're not necessarily going to do all of this together, but I just want to show you what some of that looks like so that when you are looking at this in the future, uh, you can have the same experience. So let's close this down and we'll get started from the beginning, zoom in a little bit more. And if we go to Computation Visual Editor, it's going to default to showing things with the source mode here. So uh, I actually like working in source mode sometimes, and I know how to read Markdown and understand like, oh, this is a link, this is a header. But you can imagine as you get to more complex structures like tables, it's kind of awkward to write them sometimes in pure Markdown. So what I can do is actually switch over to visual mode. And with this .qmd that I'm working on, I'm going to say, let's use visual mode. Um, it'll do all these conversions for me. So all of the markdown will actually get converted to the final format, and I'll have my headers and links and code and tables all nicely presented on the page. And if I go and find graphics, they'll actually be embedded in line along with the source code. I can still run code. Like if I were to go down and let's see, content editing, let's just say I wanted to add a code chunk here. I could insert a code chunk with R. And I can still execute that code and run it. And it's going to execute the code in line in the cell, even though I'm in this visual mode. So whether you're writing you know, computational documents or just really writing a lot of markdown, the visual editor mode gives you a lot and allows you to embed graphics and you know, gives you these word processing like abilities directly inside of our studio. So while we can turn visual editor mode on and off, and that's what you're doing with toggling between the source and visual, if I were to render this, we can compare the um, visual mode to what is the actual final output mode. So it's actually going to render that out and pop it up here in the corner. We'll take a look at it. And now it's in my browser. And this looks, again, very similar to what I saw in visual mode but I've actually rendered the document and executed and run all of the code within it. So the ability to both render, do it in source mode or visual mode, and actually get out the final output. Now, as far as other editors, um, things like VS Code or Jupyter, they have their own kind of implementation of how they approach this. So VS Code has like a, a notebook extension. And that allows you to write pure markdown. So you'd be limited to markdown, but you can use it interactively and then render and preview the output. And it also will give you, you know, working with YAML inside of your VS Code documents. So whether you're working with .QMDs or IPython notebooks in VS Code, you can also uh, write and author Quarto documents inside those interfaces and work with the YAML. Both our studio and VS Code have what's called YAML intelligence, or the ability to have auto completion for YAML. And this is, um, oh, let me pause for a second. I can see that a few people are saying they can only see the slides. And then some people can say what, so I think people can see what I'm doing, but let me know if you're not able to see the slides. Okay. All right. So it looks like people are able to see the slides. So just going through some of these. Yeah. So when we were using our Studio Cloud, um, this is the interface for our Studio Cloud that we we're using. And then we have the uh, the slides here that are all on the same page. And I believe we're able to see those all together. Yes. So I'm, I'm not actually switching into our Studio Desktop because I have this preloaded inside our Studio Cloud. So this is an environment that's pre-installed with all of the Quarto workshop materials. So for uh, both VS Code and our Studio, again, there's this ability to have uh, auto completion or YAML intelligence through through the YAML headers themselves. So your ability to like auto complete and you start typing out things like code folding or code copy, and it will actually inject and allow you to insert the code to finalize that that output. For Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, if you are using that. Um, you can still edit your uh, markdown cells and your code cells together. Um, but for the YAML headers, you'll need to do those as what's called a raw cell in Jupyter. 
Uh, YAML intelligence already exists inside our studio. So that's available in both our studio and VS Code. I was just showing it in the other one. Um, and then for Jupyter, because it kind of has constraints around the user interface, uh, all of the YAML will be written by hand, kind of the older way that you would do it inside what is called a raw code chunk. But you can still write and author those even inside an IPython notebook. For um, previewing or rendering out in things like VS Code or in Jupyter, you would use the command line interface and you do something like Quarto render or Quarto preview on that notebook. And then you could specify what type of format you wanted to convert over to. So in this case, we're converting or previewing our IPython notebook to HTML. Preview, whether you're using it in our studio or VS Code or Jupyter or anywhere else, uh, allows you to maintain a background web server so that as you make changes and save your document, it'll actually watch your source code. So if we zoom in here at the bottom, it still might be a little bit small. It says watching files for changes. What this means is that as you save, it will actually re-render the entire document and show those changes in real time on the one that's displayed and rendered out. So that's an option that's available in all the editors as well. Again, for Jupyter, the YAML is treated as a raw cell, so we're not able to add that YAML intelligence. But in RStudio and in VS Code, you have that rich experience of having like auto-completion for your YAML and that you're adding throughout the document. So what ultimately this means is that Quarto is really, really good for collaboration. You might have a project that looks something like this, where you've written some dplyr code, it's pulling some data down from AWS, and you wrote this a few months ago, so it was written in R Markdown. But then you have a colleague who's working and doing some data cleaning in Python, and they want to use an IPython notebook. And then they do a handoff, and they're writing out some code, and they generate a file through another Python notebook that is then pulled back into R through a Quarto document or a QMD, and you do some computer vision with the Torch library in R. So with Quarto, all of these different documents could actually be executed with Quarto, all within the same project and all being kind of natively executed in R or in Python or in Julia, all together within a single environment. This content section that I've added up here is really just an example. So you can imagine that this is a YAML uh, project and that there's these four files in a directory. And those are built into say like a web page or a lab notebook of some type where again, your different colleagues that you're working with are able to work in their preferred tooling and then generate this out for a specific web page or an aggregation, even though they're working on, on different things at different times. One of the other things that Quarto provides is that uh, it actually has built-in publishing. So not only can you generate things locally, write beautiful documents and create them, but you can also publish them out to the web. So Quarto Publish has a few different commands. Someone asked earlier about Quarto Pubs. So that's a free service that we provide. If you go to quarto.pub, you can sign up for that and then use it for your publishing uh, of any documents you create with Quarto. We also allow for publishing to GitHub Pages or to RStudio Connect, one of our professional products, as well as other kind of more website-y places like Netlify, uh, which is where a lot of people host blogs and personal content that they're uh, want to host and share on the web. So regardless of what kind of where you're publishing, Quarto allows you to do some of this via the CLI. And otherwise, you would just have like HTML files that you could drag and drop and put into a content management system if you wanted to go that route. I highly recommend Quarto Pub and signing up for that so you have a handle or like an account there. And then you can publish there for free and manage it and aggregate all your different content. So Quarto.pub is, is a great resource for a lot of people that want to publish. As far as for, again, some people uh, doing data science at work, maybe you're using RStudio Workbench or RStudio Connect, um, Quarto is supported on those platforms as well. So you can author Quarto documents inside RStudio or VS Code or Jupyter, all running on RStudio Workbench, and then publish and re-execute that content and code on something like RStudio Connect, which will uh, be able to process both the R and the Python code, as well as handle Quarto and many other types of uh, document formats. Just to say that if you did want to use this and you're using Workbench or Connect, that is totally possible and appropriate today. 
uh, for using it on the cloud. So someone had a good question about say like an EC2 instance. Um, if you, the marketplace is updated to the latest version of our studio, it'd be pre-installed. Otherwise you would need to install it. And there's install instructions on Cordo.org for installing it uh, to a local environment or to a Linux based environment. Part of the benefit of Cordo, again, for installation purposes, which kind of wraps well into that uh, question here, is that Cordo is bundled and comes pre-installed with our studio. So as long as you're installing uh, the latest version or in the future, uh, newer versions of our studio, uh, a new version of Cordo will always be updated with the IDE itself. Now you can install it anywhere and you don't have to use our studio to use Cordo but we are trying to integrate it as much as possible into the editor, so for this really strong experience. There's also this concept of the batteries included. So not only is it included with the editor, it's essentially always around and ready to go, but it's batteries included in terms of it's uh, not many different packages that you're installing, but one command line interface that does everything. So for our markdown, we have five different packages here. We have the core our markdown with things like HTML documents. We have presentations, PowerPoint, Sharingan for presentations, Reveal.js for presentations, Tufty and Distill articles. All of those would be separate kind of our markdown packages you'd need to install and maintain. For Cordo, once you install Cordo, it comes with all of those. And it also comes with even more. So websites and blogs or books, uh, interactive documents, as well as a few different formats that we're adding uh, later this year for things like page down uh, or flex dashboard. For those of you who are writing scientific articles, we have added um, most of the functionality for writing uh, journal articles already with Cordo. Right now it's written as an extension, but we're also going to uh, pre-install a lot of those into the Cordo CLI itself uh, later this year. So all this to say that Cordo is pre-installed with our studio, and if you're installing it separately, one installation of Porto gives you all of these features that might have been five or 10 or more different R Markdown packages. So a lot installed just at that one time. At this point, you might be asking like, wow, we went really quickly through that. Like, what about my other R Markdown documents or my colleagues or myself who have Jupyter Notebooks? What do I do with them? So for some of you, nothing changes. You can keep using our markdown and all of the knowledge you've gained over years or recently on our markdown, for the vast majority of it still applies for Cordo. So those core workflows are similar. Um, now for folks who do wanna take their existing content and render it via Cordo, you can do that a couple different ways. So you can render it with the, the command line interface. So from the terminal, do something like Cordo, render my specific RMD, to HTML, and that will take an R Markdown document and render it over to HTML. For Jupyter Notebooks, they actually store some of the computation within the source code. So it's, it's almost like a JSON blob behind the scenes. So for IPython Notebooks, you have the option of just rendering and reading the data that's stored inside the notebook or adding the execute command which will then both render and execute it linearly from top to bottom, kind of how you expect with R Markdown or with Cordo. So you have that option with those two. Uh, there's a good question about uh, learning Flex Dashboard. So Flex Dashboard will be coming to Cordo later on, and uh, that will allow you to create kind of dashboard style uh, presentations or websites in addition to more traditional uh, kind of linear uh, scrolling websites. So for some of these folks who want to compare like what, what is our markdown, what is Cordo, some of the core differences is that Cordo's batteries included. So all one install gives you everything. And there's a shared syntax across those. Because we're building them all together at once, we're also providing syntax that applies across the different formats. So things that you do for PDF also apply for HTML, also apply for Word documents or for presentations. So you can share a lot of that knowledge and syntax across them. You can also choose your own editor, and this allows you hopefully to collaborate more and better with some of your colleagues who are using other tooling or other data science languages. Cordo also comes with better accessibility and richer features out of the box. So batteries included for sure, but also the defaults are really good. I think they're very beautiful and attractive. 
but they also give you good accessibility defaults for contrast or for low vision users. Lastly, there's just going to be more enhancements over time to Cordo. Uh, our Markdown, the core package, obviously is still going to be maintained and bug fixes that are required across the R Markdown ecosystem will happen, but the majority of new features are going to be built into Cordo itself. The reason that happens is that, again, with R Markdown, you would actually be building out an entirely new R package. And again, with Cordo, you're extending or expanding the Cordo library itself or the Cordo command line interface. So rather than having to maintain an entire new package or build it out separately, uh, with Cordo, we're kind of able to consolidate our efforts and apply them all together. So again, kind of summarizing this, collaborating with others, working together with a shared format, choose your editor in your native language. So wherever you're coming from or whatever you want to use, you can use that tool in that language. As far as rendering, I've talked quite a bit about you know, using the command line interface, but that's not the only way to do it. So within our studio, and I can actually zoom in a little bit on this, I can uh, select this box for render on save. And then every time I save it, it'll actually re-render the document or I can click the render button to render the document out to that specific format. I can also use the terminal or the system shell and just call Cordo directly. So things like Cordo render this specific document to PDF or docx or HTML. And there's also an R package. Now the Cordo R package is very, very lightweight. It doesn't really do anything besides send commands to the command line interface. So while you can absolutely install Cordo, the R package, that is a very separate idea than the true Cordo install of the command line interface. So the R package is just wrapping the features that are available via the terminal. But again, you can do almost everything you need to just through the RStudio interface itself. As far as kind of taking a step back from what Cordo actually is, part of why computational documents are so powerful is kind of thinking about what is your source and what is your output. So the goal here is to partially change your mental model rather than thinking about it as like your source is your output and like they're in interchangeable and you cannot kind of extract them. So like a Word document, whenever you're typing, you can't recreate what you're typing. Just every edit you make is then saved into the document. Sure, there's things like revert or reverse or undo but you don't have source code of how you actually got there. With things like Cordo, you have your literal source code and then you have your output. So there's two things. With your data and your source code, you're able to recreate any document. So you have this ability to reproduce your findings or if, if the data is changing over time, re-execute you know, re the code with new data and see what the data says today or what the outcome is today. So by combining these together, you have reproducible documents in terms of you have like the R code and the data that got you to this report that you're able to share and collaborate on or share with your other users. But importantly, they are separate things. Both can be checked into things like version control. Uh, one contains code, one contains the output. And that's the source versus the output model that we're trying to build up here. As far as what a doc QMD looks like when you're writing it, so you might have seen this QMD here. It's got a couple of different things going on. We can break that down a bit further in terms of what we're looking at. So for a plain text file with a Cordo Markdown document, we might have some metadata or YAML. Here we could define what is the format we want to write out to, like HTML or PDF or Word. What's the engine we want to use? So maybe Knitter for R or Jupyter for Python. Then we'll have code chunks. Those code chunks can do things like load libraries and analyze data, regardless of what language you wanna use. And then you have text or what's called markup or markdown that allows you to create you know, section headers or text with bold or italics or images that you're bringing in off of disk and adding alternative text to for, uh, for screen readers. So overall, you can kind of mix these three core components of metadata or YAML that controls the overall document code, which is the actual R code or other code that you're generating in, and then all the prose or text or documentation about what you're actually doing with your code or finding with your results. 
We're going to break it down into the different components. So again, for YAML, this header is always going to be kind of the first part of your document. And this is processed along with essentially every single part of rendering. So it can affect the format. It can affect small minutia of like how the code appears or the theme, as well as making changes to actually the size of the graphics or anything else. Overall, though, you can think of it as metadata or controlling the entire document as opposed to a small component like you would do with code. YAML is going to look like this, where you have it divided and fenced with three dashes. So three dashes at the top, three dashes at the bottom, and then you define what are called key value pairs in the YAML. So you might have a title, something like my document, and then you have things where you're choosing the main option as well as sub options. So for format, we're saying format is equal to HTML. I want table of contents to be true. And I want to turn code folding on, so making it true. By nesting these different key value pairs together, you can make, again, global changes to how your document appears or what you're doing to your document. While it can seem intimidating to memorize all the different kind of core changes that you can make, again, because our studio has what's called YAML intelligence, you can actually search through the available features or have auto completion of things as you're changing them or writing them out. The next component after you finish with YAML in terms of writing your document is the actual markdown. Uh, Cordo is based on Pandoc compatible markdown. And this goal of this is that it's plain text, meaning that you can literally look at it and on disk, you can kind of read it in its plain text form and it's still easy to read, as opposed to kind of something like looking at raw LaTeX might be a little bit harder to parse through because there's a lot more formatting that's occurring. Although for some people that, that's easy for them to do, I don't find it to be the easiest. Markdown will look something like this, where on the left you have traditional markdown syntax. So using asterisks to italicize or bold text that generates italic or bold text doing things like superscripts or subscripts, strike throughs, or presenting verbatim code. On the left hand, again, we just have this ability to write the markdown, and then this is what the actual output would look like once you put it into a Cordo document. So again, while it looks a bit nicer when you see the final output, you can still kind of guess or interpret what's happening by looking at the pure markdown itself in terms of it's somewhat descriptive as to what it's doing. Some of the other really important markdown syntax that we should remember is things like headers or section headings. We do this by adding pound sign and then a text. So as we increase the number of pound signs, we get smaller headers or subsections. And you can see that as essentially they move to the right, they get smaller and kind of lower priority uh, headings or subsections. So traditionally I'll use heading one, two, and three which I can do by having one, two, or three pound signs in front of some text. You can go even smaller, but you'll notice that, you know, heading four, five, and six aren't different in size. They would only be represented by subheadings within everything else. So this allows you to, again, structure your document and have different sections or chapters that you're working in within a single document. Now, the last component of any Quarto document is assuming that you're doing some computation. So you're bringing in some code. We have a code chunk. A code chunk is always created by having three backticks, curly brackets, then a specific engine. So in this case, we're using R because we're writing R code. We then have chunk options, which in Quarto are specified by doing what's called the hash pipe syntax. So imagine this is a hash pipe or a pound sign and then a vertical uh, line. And then what are the different key value pairs you're writing here? So things like output location co equals column or label equals figure air quality and other different components that we're choosing. Then we have some actual R code. So loading ggplot and creating a plot. And based off of this, it actually puts the graphic into the column. So it puts the code on the left and the output location is the column next to it. It adds our label of temperature and ozone level, which is what we did here for the figure caption. And then the R code generates a graphic that is displayed on the presentation. 
again, I wrote my slides today with Quarto. So I was able to write the document together with uh, source code and markdown and allowed to put these in. There's a good question about uh, put options within the curly brackets. So if you're coming from our markdown, uh, you're very used to putting all of these options here or into the curly bracket section right after the uh, engine. Quarto is fully backwards compatible with our markdown's uh, knitter syntax. So you can do that. Just you'll find over time that the um, putting the chunk options like this might allow you to write more or do more with it as opposed to squishing it into the syntax up here. It also adheres to what's called YAML style syntax. So whether you're writing chunk options or in a YAML header, they will have the same words as opposed to with our markdown. There was slight differences in how you'd spell things in the YAML versus the chunk options because they weren't the same thing. Um, for doing the spacing, so someone had a question about this is a 50-50 split. If you wanted to do a true 50-50 or a 30-70 split and change that, today you cannot do that by chunk options. This is essentially a wrapper around other Quarto syntax, but you can write that Quarto syntax and I'll actually show you how to do that later on in the presentation, a good question. Again, you can do more than just R. So you, you can use Python or Julia or JavaScript or SQL or Bash or many other languages inside your documents. And again, using similar uh, syntax of like a label or figure caption, get a, a nice graphic out with its labeling. Now, again, I want to emphasize that the CLI is useful and there's a lot of things you can do with it, but you don't have to use it for everything. It, it allows you to do all these different commands with like rendering and uh, preview and publish and all these other things, but almost all of that you can also do with the RStudio editor itself. But if you feel comfortable and you should get a bit of uh, comfort using the CLI over time, you can get a lot of value out of it. There's a question about mixing R and Python. So if you're mixing R and Python together, that essentially means that you've made a decision that you're okay with having multiple languages in your environment. In that case, you would still use reticulate because you're calling R and Python together via knitter. But if you wanna have a pure Python and a pure uh, R uh, quarter document, they could use the knitter engine for R and the Jupyter kernel for Python and Julia. And those could be separate. But if you're combining the two languages for Steven's question, uh, it'll be uh, using Reticulate. I'm going to address a couple questions after I finish this section out, but good questions, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. For navigating in the terminal, again, because not everyone you know, comes from using the command line interfaces or the terminal very frequently, I've included some commands here about how to work with the terminal and do things like, where am I, what working directory am I in? change the directory, list the contents of a directory, work with Quarto and see the help files, make or remove directories as well. I've also linked out to a nice workshop by the data carpentries or a tool that actually allows you to search for different commands and define what they need. So before we get into this R turn, I'm gonna address one question. So from Marcel, how are dependencies managed in terms of R and Python packages or modules for reproducibility? For example, collaborators might be using a different version of Python, or maybe I don't even have Python installed in my system. Um, if you're using those in the same Quarto project, we would use what is called a Quarto project. And I'll actually talk about that in the second section. But there's this concept of what's called freezing computation, as well as using them with things like virtual environments with Python would be virtual env, or for R it'd be renv. Quarto respects those and allows you to use virtual environments and freeze computation. So you can actually hand off a file that's been executed and person two would then work with the same file but not re-execute the code. They'd use the stored computation that's available from the freeze command inside the Quarto object. For this R turn that we're doing here, I'm gonna again move over pretty quickly to RStudio Cloud and show a rendering via the command line interface, as well as with our studio. So inside our studio, and again, I'm inside our studio cloud environment. I'll drop that here into the chat. The goal here is that we're gonna show kind of 
taking one document and rendering it a couple different ways. So I've opened with an O1 intro, the history.qmd file, which is a Wikipedia article. So let's take a look at that real quick. The Wikipedia article looks a bit like this. We've got some history, we've got you know, a picture of some beautiful Boston Terrier dogs and some information about them. As well as there's a little bit of you know, floating hover text about uh, the different footnotes and things that are on the page. If you go back to our studio cloud, I can inside our studio, click render. And that will go through and generate an article. It looks pretty close to that Wikipedia article, but again, I wrote this with Quarto. I still have hover text over citations. I have graphics that are included in line and in the footer. And there's all sorts of other things within this document that are similar to the Wikipedia article, as well as a floating table of contents and the ability to link to specific headers or specific sections. Now, I used all that through our studio. And again, I don't have to use the CLI. I'm using our studio to do that rendering. But let's say that I want to actually generate this as a PDF because my colleagues, like, I don't want to receive an HTML file. I want to receive a PDF file. So using the command line interface via the terminal in our studio, I can quarto render 01 intro slash history dot QMD. Let's get that to PDF. So now I'm taking that same file that we're working on and using the CLI, I'm saying, hey, take this file. <laughs> Let's see if I can find it. Okay. Workshop. So I need, I didn't specify the correct directory. So workshop 01 intro slash history to QMD. Let's see where I'm at. Ah. So if I look a bit closer at my terminal, I'm already in that directory. So I'm already in history.qmd. I made it too easy for myself and tricked myself. So let's go back a bit. We're going to delete this. So now, because I'm already in the 01 intro folder, I can just specify it by name. So quarto render on history.qmd, and it's going to run through and use um, formatting this out to a PDF. And now, in the same document, I have, again, a good looking PDF. Now, importantly, you might say like, well, HTML and PDF are very different. And that's true. Part of what Quarto is providing is a unified syntax for different formats. So this looks slightly different from the HTML version because you're constrained in what you can do with PDF. But from single source and from a single source code, I was able to generate a very nice looking PDF without having to write any LaTeX. And for the nice HTML, I didn't have to write any CSS or custom HTML. This is all written in pure Quarto syntax with plain text markdown and graphics and images and text. For uh, converting it over to say a doc format or docx, so I could either change this and say like docx or a different format. So let's say control enter. Docx is a format that I can change. So that's one of the options is converting it to docx. Or if I'm using the terminal, rather than saying to PDF, I could say to docx and then convert it over to uh, Word. Now, because I'm working in our studio cloud, there isn't, you know, it's, it doesn't have Word installed. So I'm not able to actually like view the documents, but you could create that and generate Word documents as well. There's one other point that uh, Hannah brought up, which I appreciate which is for the Windows shell, if you're using, um, so Linux and MacBooks are based off a Unix style terminal. So they essentially have very interchangeable syntax. Windows does things quite differently. So it emulates what you can do with other terminals. So there's different flavors of terminals in Windows. Um, some of those such as like Git bash, which is a version of bash for Windows, um, requires you to do things like quarto.command, or quarto.execute when you're running commands inside Windows. So if you find that you write, you know, like quarto dash dash help, and rather than returning the help, it says like command not found, and you're on Windows, you could try appending .exe or .command to the end of it. That's part of a nuance of using Windows. And again, while you don't have to use the terminal, it's possible to do things inside our studio. Um, we are working on 
you know, doing more. So trying to get around some of the Windows specificities um, and make it where you don't have to append .command or .exe, but that is something you might have to use uh, depending upon which flavor of the terminal you're using in Windows. So that was the uh, end of section one. Uh, the goal there was a relatively fast, and in some cases very fast, just broad overview, just trying to show you that Quarto is a little bit different. There's some things we're going to talk about, just trying to hit the high points. The next three sections are going to go much deeper on individual portions, so like repeating syntax and covering them. Now, in case people want to take a quick break, I'm going to give us a five minute break here. So we'll return uh, at 335 Central Standard Time is my time. But just five minutes from now, we'll meet back here to start on the second section. I'm going to drink a little bit of water and then we're going to get started on authoring Cordo. But if you have questions, I'll try and answer some of those in the chat as well for y'all. Uh, but otherwise, feel free to grab some coffee or go to the bathroom or anything else you need to. And we'll be back in now four minutes. Question from Elizabeth. Can I change the YAML key value pairs via the terminal when I render files? So there's kind of two ways of thinking about this. One is like when I have this document, I already have YAML I've written, right? And it has specific key value pairs. If I change this to, to docx, I've now changed the YAML and saved it. And when I render, it'll render out to that format or to PDF. And it will render out in that way. If though I wanted to use the terminal by doing things like Quarto render to PDF, it is actually overriding the YAML that's already been written. So this is essentially like manually writing small components of the YAML. If you have lots and lots and lots of different changes you're making, it probably makes more sense to do those in the YAML because you can again get auto, uh, auto commands where it's like, okay, what's available? I can do control space. And it'll say, here's the different things you can write. As well as when I start typing things, it'll auto-complete and say, here's the different options. So it'll help you out a bit more. Again, you can do a lot via the terminal, but if you're changing many different YAML features, you might want to do that via the actual QMD itself. For presenting Quarto slides via GitHub, like I'm doing, do you just create a new repo and put the output there? Yeah, so uh, option one, if you actually go to if we go to my GitHub repository, the way that I've approached it is GitHub Pages has a native understanding of what's called a docs subfolder. So materials is the folder I'm using to organize all of my materials. And it has like 01 and all these other different slides that I'm working on. But I've used Quarto in a Quarto project to render out to the docs directory. So now when it outputs the files, it says, throw them into docs. So we'll go back to Cordo Medicine, go to docs. And now this is only the built HTML. So all this HTML is built there. On GitHub, if I go to settings on my repository and pages, it says branch from main, and that's the only branch I have and then it's building from docs. And so it'll just basically look inside my docs folder and build everything out there for uh, you know, writing it all out and, and doing available um, building of the content into a web page. Let me close down a few of these different things, keep that up. A question from Dua. Um, so authoring HTML. So parse the HTML correctly, but IntelliSense was not available in both RStudio and VS Code. So yeah, so part of working with our studio in terms of authoring this is there is kind of some expectation that you're kind of writing out the HTML by hand. And I hear you in terms of a feature request here might be um, natively writing HTML code and auto completion or IntelliSense for uh, other languages besides R and Python and, and things like that. So taking that as a feature request. Part of what you can do with the visual editor though, is let's say you want to modify this. If we were to um, insert a span, let's do a div. When I go here, it actually allows you to insert things like um, either pandoc divs or HTML divs, and then you can apply specific um, CSS or classes or IDs or other things to it. 
And this does allow you to write out a little bit of more complex kind of structures in HTML and have them work uh, together with the RStudio editor. All right. So we are, um, yes. Uh, so last question from Jeremy, is GitHub flavored markdown format available in Cordo? Yes. So if I were to go here and let's do format, G GitHub, G GitHub. <laughs> All right. Okay, so it's parsing this, let's say, GFM, uh, or uh, there's many different markdown formats. Uh, there's GFM, GitHub flavored markdown, as well as all sorts of other different markdown flavors. And if you look on um, porto.org, there's an entire section dedicated to like the 10 different flavors of GitHub or of markdown it can render out to. So now that we're a few minutes past, we're going to look at uh, section two, authoring Cordo. Here, hopefully this will go um, a little bit kind of more deep on specific topics rather than covering all these different high points. The first section was really more about motivation or like seeing what's possible. And now we're going to pull apart and look at the individual component parts. Again, for Cordo, there's three main components. There's the metadata, or what we call YAML. There's the text or markdown. And then there's code that you're using Knitter or Jupyter to execute within your document. When you add this all together, that's how you're creating these powerful and useful outputs. Is it's not just a .r or a .py file, but you're able to interject, you know, customization of how do I want to create it, or putting in text or graphics or HTML or LaTeX to present your your topic in a specific way. This is all an implementation of what is called literate programming. This idea of like writing out program logic in human language, along with primitive markup, code snippets, and macros. So if we think about, again, a Cordo document, we have the YAML header, we have markdown or markup or text, and then we have code that is actually written into the document when you're generating it. So you can write all these different components and our studio especially will help you as you write these, whether it's through the visual editor or auto completion or intelligence, but put this all together and that's actually what a Cordo document is, is actually having all these components together rather than just one or two of the different things. As far as the metadata, we're going to break down into the three sections, starting with metadata and go a bit deeper into that. So YAML, if you've never heard the definition, you can say it's yet another markup language, or for some people, they call it YAML ant markup language. The important part here is to think of it's always key value pairs. So when you're writing YAML, you always have to have three dashes to start, three dashes to close the YAML. And then in the middle, you have these key value pairs or an option and then the option choice that you're making there. Um, within a quarter presentation, I'm using opt or the alt key plus the left-hand button to zoom in on the slides, which is a nice feature that some people ask about. So what this might look like is in the YAML, you might have something like format is equal to something, GitHub flavored markdown or HTML or whatever else. So within the YAML, you'd have format equals HTML or format equals PDF or format equals reveal JS, which is how I made the presentation today. And just by changing that one component, the entire rest of the document can be the same, but you're saying take all the source code and the markdown and convert it out to this other format. But this kind of gives us a definition of that key value pair of format being our key and the value that we're choosing for that option. You can also add sub options or option arguments below that. So rather than just saying the basic defaults of HTML or RealJS, I can also nest different options within one. So format is equal to HTML, and HTML then also has subcommands. The part to remember here is that YAML is a kind of like code, very sensitive to spacing and definitions. So you can't write invalid YAML, and in order to do that, you have to space things appropriately and use the correct commands. If we go to our studio, if we were to you know, save this document and look at the source code, it's actually going to give me this error and it's saying, hey, you made a mistake, right? 
So I'm like, okay, well, what's the mistake? Key format has value table contents equal true, must be a possible value. And it's basically throwing all these errors because it doesn't know what to do with HTM. If I change it to HTML and save it, now it says, hey, this is valid YAML and it's ready to go. Or if I space things out inappropriately and try and do something like this and save it, should give me a little bit of an error. It's not throwing it right now, but it's sensitive to the spacing that we're looking at. So let's go back real quick for source. So for this, you want to have spacing uh, in an alignment. So all of your subcommands are going to be tabbed over or two spaces over from their original placement, indicating that that's a subcommand that you're uh, adding on. So key value pairs, but then if you're adding sub options for a specific thing, you can do those by including a colon afterwards and then spacing them appropriately. Sub options should always be below. So if I, again, look at this, uh, you have essentially like option one or option two, it doesn't matter what, if they're like text or numbers or logical or, or whatever, that you always wanna have them below and then moved over one position from the previous sub option. So you can see format, tab over, HTML, tab over, and then you have all these different options that are a sub option of HTML. And this will work for any format, but just the, the approach here of using the default with HTML. As far as why we even worry about writing YAML, um, we don't wanna have to write everything out by the command line interface every time. So sure, this is pretty easy to do and you could render a document from like PDF to HTML or vice versa. It's one extra command, that's fine. But then you wanna add some subcommands or options. And now you have to remember, you know, dash M code fold equals true and move forward with that. And then you would add even more, you know, sub options and parameters. And now it's like running off the page. At this point, it probably makes more sense to have that all in your YAML header so that you don't have to keep appending things to one line of the string with the command line interface, but you can define that all by the YAML like we showed in the previous slide. As far as navigating that within our studio, um, part of what I wanna show here is the Quarto workflow. So if we go back, whatever we're rendering, let's say this, show two options here. So inside our studio, We've defined our YAML and it's HTML, that's great. If we were to render this, I'm gonna keep this background job open real quick. If I click render, it actually runs that render inside what is called a background job. Now you may have never used background jobs before. They, they've been around in our studio for a couple of years now, but that essentially means it frees up your core console and it's not, you know, you can still type code in here. But Cordo talks to our studio and runs the render preview inside a background job and basically keeps this open and saying, watching file for changes. And if I were to add a space here and save, and then it could re-execute that code and re-render the document that we're seeing from, from cloud. So it's basically like maintaining that real-time preview for you until you tell it to stop. Um, this is always kind of like a single document in terms of you're working with one document at a time. If I were to render this other one, you go back, it's going to overwrite that previous one. So you're not necessarily like rendering uh, 15 different files in parallel. That's not really what the purpose is for this. It's more of like render a document and maintain that document as you're editing it. Where it can come into play is let's say you have a website like I have with a, a web page, and there's like 20 different web pages. If I were to render that inside of a Quarto project, it would render all the files um, linearly in terms of like render them all together and build them together, as opposed to just rendering one file alone. But it's always gonna be kind of one, uh, one background job at a time. Now you could start background jobs manually and say like execute um, you know, with the Quarto R package, run Quarto render and do it a bunch of different times and parallelize it that way. But that's not a common workflow that, that I'm using right now. I just really wanted to show that 
when you do render out a document, you're going to see these background jobs. And if you want to stop it, you can click the stop button. And that's kind of why it's going on. Again, if we think about rendering, that's possible via the render button that we're doing with our studio, as well as the command line interface, as well as using the Cordo R package in Cordo Render. Again, the Cordo R package is just sending commands to the command line interface. It's not actually giving you the install of Cordo or doing anything like that. It's just uh, providing some of these commands so you don't have to go to the terminal. Um, the other part, so I've talked, I kind of skipped ahead to do this because I really wanted to show that interactive workflow um, in terms of showing off the background job. So I've essentially done this, but if you wanted to, you could go to this and render it just like I did previously. There uh, was one question that's in the chat in terms of parameterized reports. You can do the same type of params workflow or parameterization of our markdown. Uh, you can do that also in Cordo with params syntax that you're familiar with. Um, I'm not covering parameterization today, but the Cordo.org uh, content has a lot on parameterization, and it's the exact same workflow as what you do with uh, our markdown previously. Now, the other part in why it's useful to write inside our studio with Cordo and why you can do things in YAML is you get linting or essentially like code analysis. So when you type something and save, it will then check your code and say, hey, I found an error. Like if I save a document and I haven't specified a format, it's looking for some string. It's basically saying like, what format are you trying to do? Are you trying to give me like ASCII doc or some other type of format? And similarly in VS Code, if I mistype my YAML, it's saying, hey, you, you mistype this and it's trying to find um, a key value pair that's not available. So the YAML linting that's available is new to Quarto and, and very, very nice. It really makes it a lot less painful to write this YAML out by hand. The other part of what uh, is provided is you can do what's called intelligence. So not only is it linting or finding things, but it also does auto completion. So I can start typing and it will pull up different commands it thinks I'm typing. And as I'm typing those out, it will you know, basically search for those commands and find them on the page as we're seeing here in the GIF. This also works for chunk options. So part of the benefit of using hash pipe syntax is you get this YAML autocompletion and search just like you would in the YAML, uh, but also in the code chunk in the uh, code chunk options with the uh, hash pipe syntax. So while this can feel a little bit different than doing it all inside the curly brackets, there are some very big benefits to doing it that way, both for consistency and for auto completion and search. Now, I talked about single source publishing a bit before, but again, a core concept of what Cordo is providing is that there are certain features that it adds that apply across formats and allow you to do what is truly called single source publishing or publishing to Word and PDF and HTML from one source code, not writing custom Word stuff, custom PDF, custom HTML, but just using Cordo for everything. The main features where this applies are called pandoc divs and pandoc spans, or what are called fence div blocks. Now, you might be familiar with CSS, but that's OK if not. What I'm showing here is I'm creating a CSS class called uh, Big Text, and it's printing text at a very large size, 120 pixels. I'm then writing what's called a pandoc div, which similar to code chunks or similar to YAML, has a starting and an ending section. So it's going to have three colons to define the start of a pandoc div and then three colons to indicate the ending of that pandoc div. And then I'm applying specific you know, commands to this pandoc div. It's basically just like a container and it says everything within this, do something to it. So within my curly brackets, I'm applying a specific CSS class or what's called big text. And when I render that, it actually shows up as really big text. Um, now, this, this example is limited to CSS, which limits me to HTML, 
But Quarto provides a number of predefined classes that apply across all formats, or at least most formats that are available to do those type of things. There's also the idea of what are called spans. So where pandoc divs apply to like an entire paragraph or an entire section, a span applies to potentially like a single letter or a single word or a subset of words within a sentence. So here I'm saying uh, this word special, I'm putting it in square brackets and then applying a specific class to it. In this case, style is color equals to red. When I render that out, the whole paragraph is not changed, but just that one word that I've applied that context to. So just special is getting the red coloring attached to it. So with these two concepts, pandoc divs, meaning three colons, and then a class within the curly brackets, ending with three colons, or with square brackets um, and these curly brackets here, you can apply different things to paragraphs or entire sections or images and, and apply a lot of stuff to that. There's a good question about our studio shortcuts to insert div block skeletons. There is. So let's say um, I'm inside our studio in visual editor mode. If I go to insert, there's this idea of inserting a div. And I can say, you know, let's say, you know, dot big text. Now I haven't defined dot big text inside this document but it will actually give me that, that div. If I go back and look at the source code, oh, sorry, let's find, gotta find that because I made a big one. There it is. All right, so I've got my three colons and then my class and then three colons. The other option is what is called code snippets. So I go to edit code snippets, markdown, um, I can define snippets that do things like insert dot columns syntax, which is used to create different columns in, uh, in presentations and other things. And I could inject that as some type of snippet that I'm defining. But the visual editor applies it, or you can define custom snippets to do whatever the heck you want. Again, just building up on this idea of fence divs, always starts and ends with equal and matching number of colons. Typically, you'd have something like three colons and three colons to start and end it. But for nesting or like aggregating multiple things onto a single piece of content, you might want to go more than three. So you could do three or four or five or six or however many you want to visually separate the nesting of divs within each other. The important part is whatever you start with, you have to end with an equal amount. And by default, you can actually just use three for everything. That's a good place to start. But you might see examples with like four or five or six. That's fine. They just have to match the ending. If they're mismatched, it will never end. And Quarto doesn't know that it's ending and, and it kind of messes up the formatting. As far as nesting, what I mean by that is there's things like dot columns and dot column syntax. This allows me to put text side by side, like create a left column and a right column, like a 50% and a 50%. I'm using four and four to start and end. And that will allow me to uh, visually say like, okay, this is the bigger one. So it's like the parent div. And then these are the children div within it. Um, you don't necessarily have to always do it that way, but it helps with me in remembering the start and the end. And then within that, I have a three ending with a three and a three ending with a three. You can nest many different things like columns and tab sets and other things. Um, just realize that um, some things work better together and maybe it makes more sense to have like a tab and within a tab you have columns or vice versa but you can nest different things together and see what components work. As far as if you're familiar with HTML, you might be saying like, why am I writing three colons instead of just using a literal uh, div from HTML? Importantly, using these pandoc divs or these Quarto specific divs, those apply across formats. So again, you could have a div that applies to Word and PDF and HTML, as opposed to having literal HTML that only works for HTML type outputs. So you can think of them as similar if you have that mental model built up, but in generally, um, I'm gonna suggest using 
literal uh, you know, colons as opposed to writing divs because they're generally transferable. If you're writing raw CSS and HTML, that's totally fine. You can use raw HTML, but these pandoc divs with the colons allow you to apply across formats. So for example, this section here, so three colons, layout number of columns equals two, creates two images. So there's you know this male Boston Terrier and female Boston Terrier image. And it will actually separate them out into a left column and a right column and present that in any format. So it doesn't matter which format you're using. You could accomplish that with HTML or CSS, but then you can only use it with an HTML. With this, you can again apply it to any format. Um, you can mix and match text and images with this. That's called like block layout, where you have like text and then a graphic. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the tables and graphics section. Another example of what you can do with these pandoc divs is something called callout blocks. And again, three colons to start, three colons to end. And then I'm applying a specific class or what is called dot callout dash note. And these can be like warnings or notes or important or captions. And they inject this like color or this kind of call out box that says, hey, pay attention to this, this little part I'm doing. For all of these different types, they're still using the same syntax. So three colons to start, three colons to end, but then they have different classes applying. So call out dash note or call out dash tip. And just by changing that one word, you're able to get a different presentation, but you're still using that same thing you've learned of a pandoc div with your three colons to start and three colons to end. So you'll start seeing these over and over throughout Cordo syntax, and that's where you get a lot of power to do things across different formats. So we're gonna go to the callout boxes and look at that really quickly. So if I go back to our Studio Cloud, Cordo Workshop authoring, callout boxes. Again, I've got all these different uh, pieces of code. I'm going to delete the code chunk so I can see those. And then I can render these out and I get to see all the different outputs that I've created. So now you have like these actual callout notes or captions, and you can even do collapsible uh, callouts so that you can have like a really long section that someone could open up to say like, oh, learn more about this. But for most people, they're not gonna read it. But for some people, you want them to have it available to read. So you can have these collapsible callouts as well. So I've included a lot of different syntax that's available for, for this type. And that's included in the RStudio Cloud section. Mainly just to show you that this is the syntax and it actually works in practice as well. Another really good question that someone had was about using tab sets. And tab sets, again, use the same syntax. So you can use these three colons and then panel tab set. And you define your panels by different uh, headers or different sections within it. So I'm always going to start with three and end with three. And then I have things like two pound signs and then a title, and then two pound signs and a title to indicate the second version. So maybe I have tab sets that have like code and output. So first I show the code and don't evaluate it. And then I show the output without the code. So you could use this to first display the code and display a graphic or whatever, however you want to use it. You could have as many tabs as you want, each separated out by their own specific header. So to create that code that we just saw in the previous slide where we had uh, headers that we could click between, I use this code of Zoom in on that. Three colons to start, and then at the bottom, three colons to end. Dot panel tab set for creating these panels. And then a level two header to define each of the specific tabs. And again, that gives me like a specific thing of code or output or whatever else I want to title these is whatever is added to the colon or to the uh, level two headers that are seen here. Another option, and again, we're, we're kind of just building up more you know, familiarity with using pandoc divs in many different ways. You can also do things like layout specific images or graphics. And there's several different ways to do this. Um, these are called layout divs, and you're typically using those to layout or typeset images, although you can do some of that with mixing text and images. 
Option one is uh, there's some predefined classes, things like layout number of columns or layout number of rows. And those take a single number, basically saying like, I have two columns and however many images there are, fit them always into two columns. Or I have a specific number of rows of three and however many you know Im images there are, fit everything into three rows. And you can define whatever number you want, like two, four, five, three, whatever. A more flexible option is just the pure layout class. And this allows you to define exact kind of percentages to how you lay out an image. So let's say you would read this as 70% for the first image, 30% for the second image. And then because we're closing this with square brackets, we're adding a new line. And then the third image will be 100% of the width. You can do more than just like pure 100% addition, but I find that a lot easier to follow along with because then you're doing kind of like 70, 30 or 50, 50, 60, 40, everything adds up to hundred and it's easy to parse. Layout can also accept negative values and negative values in interject white space or gaps. So here we might have like 40% for image one, a blank space of 20%, 40% for image two, and then 100% again for the last image. So you can mix and match kind of this idea of like white space and image alignment and image width, however you'd like to. What this looks like in practice is let's say I have this figurative, three colons to start, three colons to end, I have three images that I'm presenting here. Image one is gonna be 40%. Then there's gonna be a 20% gap, another 40% image, closing the section off. And then the second row will be 100% of the width. And if I actually graph this out, that's exactly what I get. You know, something that's about 40%, 40%, 20% of blank space. And then this one really big image on the bottom. And you can use this, again, across different formats. So using this layout allows you to structure slides as well as static reports or PDFs or HTML or, or whatever different format you'd like to. So a lot of power there. I, I really find that these like number of columns and rows are probably the easiest to use because you it's just like layout number of columns is two and just like have a, a grid that you're working with but you can have this really tight custom control if you want to go that far. Now we focused almost exclusively on these divs because we're thinking of like structuring an entire document or typesetting an entire document. Uh, spans on the other hand, allow you to apply things to like a single item or single string within a sentence. So for example, you see this down here, this is a footnote and it's actually describing itself. So if I have this string, maybe a footnote, and it's got this number one saying, this is the first footnote in the presentation, I actually created that by saying maybe a footnote and then using this um, tilde up and then square brackets to add the text. So I can basically say for this whole string, you know, whatever it's attached to, add this footnote to the end of it. And then within the footnote, I've added, this is important text or, or whatever else I wanna show. So you can add different things and like footnotes or citations are, are one example of where a span is really useful in addition to just like coloring text or something. I can also do things like magically appearing words with an additional point after, like basically make specific parts of my sentence apply to effectively bring a point home. And that would be done with, again, the span syntax of a square bracket around the strings closing with another square bracket, and then applying the specific class to it. In this case, what is called a fragment, which makes it appear later in the presentation. So magically comes first, then I have appearing word with an additional point after, and I have two sets of spans with two different fragments within a single sentence. So this allows you to, whatever you're doing, just like apply things to individual components of your, of your talk or document or whatever else you're working on. So we've covered a lot about kind of some of the markdown and we're going to do more of like specific graphic and arrangement in the uh, plots and tables section. But we also want to talk a little bit about code 
because again, if you're coming from the R Markdown world, there are some changes that are beneficial. So number one, uh, depending upon which language you're using, you're gonna wanna specify an engine. If no engine is specified, and I have YAML looks like this, where it just says format, Portal will use whatever language is found first. So it finds some R code, it's gonna try and use Knitter. If it finds Python or Julia, it's gonna try and find a Python or a Julia uh, kernel to use. You can force it to use something like Knitter, where an example, maybe you have Python first, but you're using Reticulate to call Python and R together, and you can still use the Knitter engine for that. In the kind of Jupyter, Python, Julia ecosystem, you can you know, specify, just use Jupyter as the engine, or you can even specify a specific type of Python, like Python 3 or Python 3.10 or whatever else, or you can go all the way down to a very specific Jupyter kernel that you've created. So maybe I have like a virtual environment with a Python kernel that's attached to it, and I can bring that specific kernel in and have that type control. For our users, you can again kind of just default to leaving it blank and just having the R code be evaluated or specifying engine is equal to knitter if you're having some um, options. There's a question about spans and can they be made programmatically? Um, I mean, you could have like a snippet that adds a span similar to like how code snippets work in our studio. You can do those with like shortcuts. Um, and you, there's not necessarily like a Quarto specific way of like injecting spans to specific components. Like you're telling Quarto with a span to do those, those parts. As far as knitter code cells, that's where I'm gonna focus a lot today. My assumption is that it's a lot of, you know, R in medicine users. So we're gonna talk exclusively about R, which is valid for today. There's a lot of options that you can see for the Knitter specific details at Quarto.org or the Knitter package, as well as it for Jupyter users, the uh, Jupyter cells. The big part to remember about code chunks is similar to everything else. There's a starting and an ending. So three backticks, and then within the curly brackets, you define the language like R or Bash or SQL. Then below that, you have your chunk options basically this hash pipe syntax or pound sign in a vertical line. And then you have your key value pairs, and then you can add your R code below all your key value pairs. This is the structure that Quarto prefers. You can still write it with uh, older kind of R markdown syntax, but you don't get all those niceties of like the auto completion and the consistency between the YAML header and the code chunk options themselves. So for this example, we have some R code. Um, I've got one mistake and maybe we caught it, which is up here. I don't actually have, um, I have labeled twice. So part of this is like, if you just do a comment or a pound sign, it's not gonna be able to interpret that. It basically says, oh, this is a comment, ignore it. You have to have that pound sign in the vertical line for it to actually pick up on uh, the Quarto options that you're placing. After you've written one a hash pipe, if you click enter, it will insert more hash pipes and you can continue filling it out. And then if you click enter twice, it will give you a blank space they can continue working with. So for this, we have you know, a nice uh, graphic that we've created and a bunch of different options for like the label or the figure caption or the warning and, and everything else we're creating. Again, you can do the same thing with Python, but we're gonna focus on R for today, but the same syntax is used regardless of language or bash or anything else. To create code chunks, you can manually type them. You can click back tick, back tick, back tick, curly bracket, R, curly bracket, but more often you're gonna either use the shortcut. So command option I or control alt, control alt I in Windows and Mac or there's the add chunk command in the editor toolbar. So if I go back to our studio cloud, um, there's this insert code chunk button. So let's say I delete this. I can do a code chunk and it will insert a code chunk for me. Or if I do uh, control alt I or command alt I, it will inject a code chunk for me uh, based upon what's available in the document. So you can just insert those automatically without having to manually type out everything. Lastly, there's also the command palette. 
So if you go to, um, let's say, delete this, make some space here, Command Shift P opens what is called the command palette. And this allows you to do anything that's a shortcut. So if I say insert a new R chunk, I'll insert a new R chunk. And if I do Command Shift P again, insert a new bash chunk, it will insert a bash chunk wherever my cursor was. So Command Shift P gives you this ability to search all the different commands and you can do any shortcut that way inside our studio. Again, if you've used our markdown before, you're probably familiar with syntax like this. You have a chunk label, then a comma, and then option equals true, or, or this kind of equals syntax and everything jammed into the curly brackets. That is still valid with Cordo. So I mean, if you have older R Markdown documents or if you just write out this way, that's fine. You know, you, you can still do it that way, but you don't get all the auto completion or the consistency between the YAML syntax. Again, uh, Cordo is introducing this hash pipe syntax where you have a hash pipe and then the key value pairs, as opposed to using the equal sign and having some of this kind of inconsistency between what the YAML looks like and what the actual uh, chunk options look like. So this is the preferred syntax, although again, backwards compatible with uh, our markdown. If you're trying to remember how what is called, uh, there's a great song by Weezer called Hashpipe. And that's how I always think of it is like, it's a pound sign and a slash or a vertical line or a hash pipe symbol or the pound sign pipe symbol. As far as why this is an option, like why did we change things around? Number one, it gives us consistency across engine. So for Jupyter and Knitter, it's the same kind of approach. There's consistency across the YAML and the chunk options, as well as the uh, fence div. So if you write things you know, with the fence divs like this, there's consistency with the naming of those uh, across all the different ways that you write them. Lastly, you also have a lot of control over the order or spacing of chunk options. You're not just limited to one line that keeps on running, but you can add things below each other. So we look at this chunk option, there's eight lines or seven lines of, of chunk options that we've added here. So I've got a warning goes false, figure caption, all these short things, but then line six through eight is actually all alt text. And you can imagine writing alternative text and you're describing this graphic, uh, it might be very long. You might have a lot of text. And if you try to squish that into one line of code, it's gonna wrap and wrap and wrap and be a bit messy to work with. But with uh, the YAML style, you can do another vertical line and then however many lines of text that you want to all within this single key value pair. There's not a shortcut for the hash pipe in terms of it is uh, one, it's really like two, two command presses. But let's say we did like label equals Tom's chunk. Every time I click enter, it's going to add a new hash pipe below it. So class is equals true. And I click enter and insert another hash pipe. So I really only have to write one hash pipe and then I'm ready to go. So I don't have to, well, it's not a shortcut. There is those helpers of every time you click enter, it'll inject a new one. If I click enter again, it'll then go back to being a code chunk below that. Um, for some of y'all, you might've actually used um, R code inside your uh, syntax for chunk options. And you can do something similar with R uh, inside Knitter and Cordo as well. So here on line three, I have, I'm using what's called the exclamation expression syntax. And this allows me to evaluate any R code I want uh, within that chunk option. So I'm gluing together the mean temperature was mean of air quality temp, and then I'm rounding it off. And that prints out the figure caption as the mean temperature was 78, which looks pretty valid. Like most of the values are kind of within this range. So I'll take that as the mean is about right here, which looks pretty valid to me. But again, any R syntax you wanna evaluate, you can do that with exclamation expression in the chunk option itself. For Quarto and R Markdown, you might be thinking at this point, well, like I have older R Markdown syntax, maybe I want to convert that over, or do I have to convert it over? Again, there's a lot of backwards compatibility with Quarto and R Markdown, and especially if you've done pretty traditional like HTML and PDF documents, 
um, they're going to transfer over very well. So on the left, we have like output equals HTML document. Porta's changing that to like format equals HTML. But then like table of contents, number section, CSS, there's consistency there between what the old names were and the new names. But again, Cordo is focused on real YAML syntax. So it has dashes and no underscores, for example, where our markdown was less consistent with having underscores in some dashes. YAML is, and Cordo is always going to follow this kind of word dash word syntax, as opposed to our markdown has some like underscore syntax or uh, other things where it wasn't as consistent with traditional YAML style um, writing. Now, you don't have to change all these things. If you use like the Cordo CLI, you can render an existing R markdown as is. But if you did want to convert them, there's some of this consistency in a good way between the two documents. Just to prove it, I'm going to go in and in the uh, workshop materials, 04 static, and open up an old R markdown. It's pretty basic, but just proving that this is a uh, .rmd and the output says HTML. You can see it has the knit button here. So if I were to knit it, it would actually be our markdown. I can either use Cordo, Cordo render with the R package or from the terminal, Cordo render old R markdown, markdown.rmd, and that would actually render it out to, uh, to Cordo, even though it says .rmd. The other option would be either changing format to HTML, and then you can see it pops up to the render button instead of the knit button. So let's take that back. When I save, you see how it switches from format to, or from render to knit, or I can rename it to .qmd, and that will force it to always be a QMD document um, and show it off as, as a QMD as opposed to an R markdown. So let's rename that one more time. Let's, end up, oh, let's just rename this back. I don't want to modify that too much for you. So you can render via the CLI to force even old R markdown to be rendered as Cordo moving forward. Now, if you had something that you're like, I'm really adamant in, I want to modify our markdown to now be Cordo and be stable as Cordo. Option one, change that RMD to QMD. This will force Cordo to be used for rendering. Or you can change, you can keep the .rmd uh, file type, but change the output to use format. And basically say like format equals HTML, that means you use Cordo. The other part is you have all these chunk headers or chunk options. Uh, Knitter, the dev version as of a few weeks ago, um, has an experimental function called convert chunk headers. And that will convert all of these like figure dot width syntax to the hash pipe syntax throughout an entire document. So you could very quickly take an existing RMD and convert all of the options to hash pipe style syntax across the entire thing. Importantly, though, like you don't have to change all this because there's backwards compatibility. You can leave it as is, but if you really wanted to like show this off for like educational purposes or just so that you have all those nice features, you can use that to convert all the chunks over. Now, if you remember, we had those uh, figure divs or pandoc divs, and we can do similar things with chunk options uh, and make plots from code in a similar way. And again, this is part of the consistency between uh, YAML, chunk options, and pandoc divs. So if we look here, we've got some you know, normal code, but then line four has this layout number of columns equals two. Because I'm generating two graphics with ggplot, when I render this, it'll actually generate two graphics. So you know, left and a right, basically two columns fit the graphics into whatever those are. Because I am um, Displaying this on a slide, you can see that they're kind of running off the page, but they are at least stuck into their own uh, columns as appropriate, uh, because that's what I'm telling it to do. For Madeline, there was a question about a hash pipe shortcut. There is not a shortcut for hash pipe. It's a, it's a short kind of option. Let's go to here. Once I type one, 
um, and then say like label equals true. Whenever I click enter, it will add a new hash pipe uh, below that until I click enter again, and then it will go back to normal code. So it does have some helpers, but there's not necessarily a shortcut for it. So you can do um, you can do more than just you know the layout number of columns. There's all sorts of other things you can do. So you can do like two figure captions and display those, but beside or below a graphic. And we can use our uh, percentage based layout also within the chunk options. So before we were doing a pandoc div on figures that already existed on disk. And again, here we're creating graphics and then doing the custom layout. So with this, you're gonna say 40% for image one, blank space of 20%, and then 40% for image two. And when I do that, that's exactly what I get. You know, I get one graphic, some blank space in the middle, another graphic, and then I have two figure captions here, and those are applied to image one and image two. So whether you're using chunk options or using the pandoc divs, you can apply similar syntax between them and the layout um, and the kind of hash pipe syntax makes it pretty easy to do all that. Another part that a lot of people care about in terms of like creating their documents is making them look uh, a lot of better. Um, so Jonathan had a good question and I'll address that. Cons, pros and cons of using ggplot title labels versus figure caption. Number one is if you do a ggplot label that's embedded in the graphic. So it's not actual text, it's part of the image. Um, figure captions are literal text. So if I like um, zoom in here, like this is text on the page. It's not part of the graphic where it's attached to it. Um, that means that you can separate out creating the graphic from the very long description. So you might have someone give you a graphic and you're adding captions to it and you don't have to recreate the graphic. You can just inject captions onto it. Or you can use R code to evaluate and create um, figure captions based off of something and have them automatically numbered without having to use things like patchwork or uh, cowplot. Good question. So in terms of creating like actual good looking documents, um, again, I think that each the Quarto defaults are pretty nice, um, but there's a lot of options that you can customize across it all. So if you're thinking of HTML, it's gonna be styled with what is called Bootstrap 5, or this is a CSS framework that's used for websites and many other things. And it comes with a bunch of different themes. So there's 25 total themes that Quarto bundles and you can further customize them. To use a theme, it's one extra line of code. So you say format equals HTML and theme is equal to Latera. Or if I wanted to uh, add additional customization to an existing theme, I could also include a .scss file or this kind of SAS variables that allow me to change specific components of, of the theme that I'm using. Now, as far as what themes look like, uh, you might have something like this, like a traditional blog, and it's using the Latera theme, very minimalistic, almost like 538.com or something. Or you could have a dark mode theme uh, like we see here with Bootswatch, or one that's a little bit kind of more uh, blue and kind of like a sky-based theme. And there's all sorts, there's 22 other different themes you could apply, but just note that with these themes, they change text, they change background colors, they change every component of your, of your page, as opposed to having to do it piecemeal by piecemeal. Again, I'm linking out to all the different themes, but we can go and look at the 04 static boot swatch themed. So we go to Quarto Workshop, 04 static, boot swatch themed. So it's gonna start with uh, Yeti, but let's change that to Quartz and then we'll render that out. Now, when I get this, you can see that it's got this kind of transition of colors behind the background and it's changed uh, the text to be white and then you've got like a color call out behind it. If I wanna change that back to Latera, for example, just change out the one theme component, render it, and then this document will change. And now it's a bit more traditional looking. And again, it's changed the font, the color, all these different aspects of, of the report. 
If you can't remember what themes are available, you can just type theme and then control space, I believe. Nope, Matera, save that real quick. Should, oh, it's not auto-completing for me, but there's a lot of different uh, options there in terms of like the different Bootswatch themes that you can use here. So they're linked out to, I really, really, really like Matera, but there's other ones that you might uh, get more value out of and really like. So you can change those by modifying the theme component within uh, a Quarto document. I'm going to briefly cover uh, some formats like presentations, and then we're going to take another quick break and go into graphics and tables, and then finish with a deeper dive into uh, static documents. For presentations, uh, the kind of the joke is that this entire presentation, you can just kind of write it in the same syntax. So reveal.js is how I wrote the presentation for today in Quarto. And it gives you these interactive um, kind of JavaScript-based uh, presentation format, but you write it all with Markdown. You're going to use format is equal to reveal.js. And then you have a uh, separation of slides by using um, either level one or level two headers. So slide one, some content or list or graphic, whatever you want in it. A new slide is indicated with a level two header, additional content, and then an image. And then slide three with another level two header, a code chunk, and some chunk options. And that's essentially what this entire presentation was written like. And part of what uh, Quarto provides is you can also visual edit um, presentations in addition to static documents with, with Quarto. So you can convert some of these level one headers, level two headers out to what they're expected and author nice looking presentations inside our studio with Quarto. Um, there's a lot to go into presentations, but the main things that I would focus on is use level one and level two headers to separate your slides. You can add all sorts of content, lists, images, code. Uh, you can use fence divs for columns. For example, like here's some content on the left with a list and a paragraph. And then I have an image on the right, which is my dog Howard. And he's really smushed up against the side of that column over there. So with presentations, this fence div of columns is really useful for you know, structuring your page. Again, I'm doing my opening and closing of those fence divs. Let's zoom in a little bit on that. So I have four to start, four to end. I'm using dot columns to initiate a section of columns. And then I'm adding uh, a dot column and a dot column to separate it out into a left and a right column. I'm also adding an additional class called a fragment on there, which is what allows it to show up as first the left, then the right. And that will allow me to display certain chunks of content as they pop up. And you can nest these even further, but this is about as far as I go is like two columns or maybe three columns with fragments to show them up as they uh, appear on the presentation. But just showing you that, again, learning those fence divs allow you to be very powerful, regardless of the format you're creating, whether it's a presentation or, or a document itself. Someone was asking about uh, collaborating with Quarto projects and using like Python code and libraries with R code and, and R end and things like that. Quarto projects are one of the most effective ways to use that. Quarto projects are really directories that provide a way to render all or some of the files in a directory together. For example, like Quarto render my whole project or Quarto render on my entire blog or website. It also allows you to share repeated YAML across all of the documents. So you can imagine rather than writing YAML 15 times for 15 documents that are all the same, you can actually use um, Quarto projects and an underscore Quarto.yaml file to apply the same YAML across all the documents that are available. It also allows you to like redirect output. So for someone who's asking about how to use GitHub pages, I'm using a Quarto project to render my documents to the doc directory. So that when I put it on GitHub, it automatically builds as a, a web page. And then for collaboration, you can use freeze to freeze computation. And that basically says like render a document and then store the output for the entire document. 
And if you transfer it to a colleague, as long as you don't edit that document and you just add your new ones, uh, it doesn't have to re-execute the code or even have code on that system. Now there's special types like websites or books or other kind of projects that you can create, like creating a blog, for example, but quarter projects don't have to be a website. It could just be an aggregation of files. One second. As far as for Quarto projects, um, creating a minimal one, uh, you have to have at least some Quarto document and what is called an underscore Quarto.yaml file. And that's what actually creates a Quarto project. Um, usually that's gonna have like a project at the top and then you can say something like output directory is output or docs or whatever. And then you have some YAML that you're applying to every file in that directory. So maybe like table of contents, or maybe you're rendering to HTML and rendering to PDF for all of your reports. And you can further customize the things within the specific documents, but this will apply by default to, to everything across every folder uh, in, in that project. If you want to learn a lot more about like building a blog or building a website, um, my colleague Isabella Velasquez, about a week from today, so next Tuesday, is going to be walking through on YouTube um, building a blog with Quarto and using Quarto projects. She's doing that for an entire hour. And again, that's a great opportunity to focus just on Quarto projects. And you can add it to your calendar via this link, rstd.io slash Quarto blog. Um, or you can just join it on the R Studio YouTube without having to sign up for anything. I'm gonna skip forward through this. One person at the start asked why the name Quarto. So number one, we named it Quarto because it's based upon a publishing format from the 1400s. What you see here on the page is actually the front and back of a single kind of piece of paper. So you can imagine if I had one piece of paper and I printed uh, kind of four sections on each page. When I fold it in half and fold it in half again, I have essentially like a document. I can just cut the top of it. And now I have eight pages formed from just four prints on either side. And that's what was classically called a quarto, uh, which was a form of publishing uh, in the early 1400s. Um, so that's kind of where we got the name for quarto because quarto is a publishing format in modern times it felt like a, a good mix and mash between historical use and um, kind of current use today. We're gonna take another quick break. So we'll take uh, about a five minute break right now. See you back in uh, about five minutes from right now. And we're gonna start on plots and tables and go over a little bit more of that syntax and creating uh, graphics and tables and aligning them together and doing even more with that. All right, I see, I see your question, uh, Jonathan. So yes, that's partially a, um, my question would be, are you doing markdown tables, like literally writing them by hand or using an R package to create tables? Okay, so um, not all packages can generate the same things across formats. You can imagine that at the package level, it's pretty hard to develop for uh, Word and for LaTeX and for HTML at the same time. There are some packages that make that easier. Um, GT Summary, so the GT Summary R package is one I'm gonna talk about that actually wraps several packages, including GT and Flextable and other ones that is really good at kind of taking um, statistical tables out. If you're seeing inconsistency there, uh, you might wanna reach out to uh, Daniel Solberg. Um, he's actually, I think he did a workshop yesterday on GT Summary and he was using Quarto. Um, and I know I've used it personally and it's worked out good for me. So if you are seeing uh, problems there, it might be worth opening an issue on the repository um, to make sure like what, what's kind of going wrong and he can help diagnose some of that. Feel free to tag me on that issue though, and uh, I can work with Daniel and we can kind of figure out if there's an issue with Quarto and it's doing something weird, or if there's uh, something at the GT summary package level. 
but in theory, GT summary should work for PDF and for HTML. We're gonna come back together in about two minutes. And yes, uh, thanks Jonathan. Yeah, uh, glad that you're able to do that workshop. I think there's some overlap and kind of walking uh, on the same topics with GT Summary in this quarter workshop. I think uh, Daniel probably just approached it more from a uh, very heavy focus on maybe the clinical reporting with tables. And this is much more focused on like general tables uh, and some of the quarter specific syntax. Daniel's great though, in terms of a uh, very, very good programmer, very kind person. So if you do have an issue with um, it, it kind of not displaying properly, I think an issue on GT summary would be a good start. And then feel free to tag me in on that as well. All right, we are back. I'm gonna be jumping a bit more into plots, graphics, and tables. Some of this is just talking a bit more about some of those layout options and kind of, again, we've gone through some of this and just kind of repeating and providing some context about how things work. Um, but this hopefully looks similar to what we talked about briefly earlier. So there's these layout options for on-disk graphics. So things like layout number of columns equals two. Uh, this allows us to take two images or multiple images and put them all together and present it on the page. Now, the part that you're also seeing is that we have a caption of like A and B and sleeping and happy. And then we have an overall figure caption of like figure one, the two states of Howard. I can actually make this full screen to zoom in a little bit more on that. How we're doing that is by giving uh, these their own uh, kind of figure uh, ID. So adding uh, a span to this. So the curly brackets with uh, the pound sign and then a name, pound sign and a name to each of the images, giving them a description. So here in the square brackets on the left, adding what we want the caption or label to be for those and then adding an overall uh, caption label for all the graphics as the final sentence within that. And if we do it this way, that's how we're able to get, you know, graphics with sub labels and IDs and an overall label for the captions together in terms of this is two images as the two states of my dog. He's either always sleeping or always happy. Another option is with number of columns equal two, uh, so here we were, you know, doing all the different captions and labeling. You don't have to use those. So you could just use, you know, uh, separating them out with layout dash number of columns equal two and putting those together and you would get essentially like a similar image, like it would give you this like on a table or off a table, uh, but you don't have to use those sub captions if you're just trying to typeset them or lay them out on the image. As you aggregate more images and you're not just with two, um, maybe you have four or six or 10 or, or even more, um, you might wanna switch between number of columns and number of rows and make things go a bit more laterally or horizontally depending upon how your uh, document is structured. Number of rows equals two will basically like always have two rows and append onto those. It will never go longer than two. It will keep adding on kind of left to right as it adds images onto there. So that's another option is like switching from number of columns to number of rows and then controlling it. Again, you can add uh, specific captions to these if you want to, or add an overall figure caption at the bottom. Now, 
you can add basically anything into a figure div. Like here I have like an iframe to a YouTube video about baby elephants. Um, I didn't necessarily create this as something, I, an image I pulled off of disk. I just wrote it as a raw pandoc div. So here I have a three colons to start, a label in terms of this is fig elephant as the ID for it. Then I'm just using literal HTML to do an iframe and giving it a uh, figure caption of elephant as the final uh, piece of text. And this will say figure two, and specifically it's saying figure two because figure one already exists in my document. So I didn't have to write out figure two equals elephant. It will automatically add the numbering system uh, to images as you add them into your overall documents. So we can go between the uh, row and column layout by going back to figure layout. So we go to our studio cloud and we go to visuals. There's a lot going on in here. So we can go to plot layout.qmd. It has some options for using it with code chunks. So you have layouts in terms of the code chunk options, as well as basic plots with um, doing ggplots. And then it even has uh, figure layout two, which has some more of the uh, kind of captions like we were saying. So let's take this one. This is figure dash layout two. If I render that, it'll show the different structure of the document. Now, I'm not as focused about showing the specific code here, but just showing you outside of a presentation, the structuring of these images is a lot more useful because you can scroll as opposed to on a presentation, if you add more rows to it, they're gonna go off the page. So we can add like the uh, labels for excited and sleeping, still excited, still sleeping, and then a figure caption. And then below that it has figure two and then figure three. So it's automatically numbering these, even though I'm switching between like row and column layout and the overall structure of how I'm setting up these different images together. So we, while we can swap between them, as you add them into kind of a more traditional layout of a, of a document, um, it'll add on all those numbering systems to it as well. Now, I talked earlier about the percentile-based custom layouts. Um, I still think that's much more intuitive, but you can also use just a pure numbering system of like ones. And here, uh, you know, like it's going to read this as two equal sized images on section one. And then below that, one that takes up 100%. So by doing that with the layout, we get something similar to this, where it basically tries to fill as much as possible the space with uh, the image on the bottom. And then the two images on the top are equal width uh, up there even though the images themselves are vastly different in size. Um, so while this is possible, I still would rather prefer to see this as like 50, 50, 100, and using that percentile-based syntax um, that's a bit more intuitive to me and more consistent when you're looking at it and trying to interpret it. If we were to do that with the percentile syntax, we would do it as like 70, 30, and then 100%. So here we have one that's a, a large image taking up 70%, a somewhat vertical image that's 30%. And then below that one that's trying to take up as much uh, space as possible of essentially like the entire row uh, for that document. And again, these images are not actually scaled um, behind the scenes. Like they're very large images and they wouldn't actually fit together very well, but Quarto is doing its best to align them and structure them according to the percentiles that you're placing there. <laughs> Howard gets all the treats. So he is very much a, a cat dog or a lap dog, and he gets to hang out with me all the time. So he gets uh, all the photo shoots for sure. Good call, Madeline. Um, for the layouts, again, part of the benefit of why I like the percentage based layouts is you can do like these negatives and they actually make sense. So I have like 40%, negative 20, 40% to make a total of 100. And that gives me like half and half, some space in the middle, and then baby Howard taking up the bottom of the page uh, as he's on the table. So just structuring it this way, you can do it, a, slice the dog or slice the cat up a bunch of different ways, um, but percentile based is, is the one that I'm most comfortable with and I think is, is what I prefer teaching. 
if you were trying to do vertical layouts, like you could imagine I have this very tiny image and I'm doing this where it's like, uh, he's a baby puppy and I'm trying to make it smaller and over to the right. Uh, you can get into these really complex layouts where you have layout and numbering systems with like some negative space. And it's basically like mostly picture one, partially picture two, a little bit of blank space. And then I'm vertically aligning them to the bottom. So even though this one is very tiny, it's pulling it to the bottom. And again, this is layout or format agnostic. So you can use these different types of layouts for all sorts of different documents uh, without having to figure out how do I do this in Word versus do it in PDF versus do it in, in HTML or CSS. So it's very extensible, but you, know, you don't have to use all these different features all at once. You can start with some of the basic layout number of rows and number of columns. That takes us back to the document we were looking at that had like all the different figure layouts together with number of rows and number of columns. Um, I'm probably gonna leave that one as more of, we've seen parts of it, but just so you can play around with it in, in the future. Now, the other part is with, uh, let's see. Yeah, Hannah, I'm not actually sure. That's a good question. Can you specify exact dimensions? I believe that's partially why you're not limited to the 100% syntax. You could imagine doing something like um, 500 and 100 and thinking of it closer to like almost like a actual pixel widths, but it's not true pixel width. You do that more with uh, code chunk options where you could do like fig uh, dash width is equal to something and you can layer those together. That's kind of what we're doing here. Not, not fully, but like when you're doing code chunk syntax, you have a, a lot more tight control over exact uh, sizing of images. So again, those figure layouts work for, for graphics. Um, whether you're doing them in Pandoc divs or in code chunks. So here, layout number of columns is equal to two. Because I'm creating two graphics, um, I can align them in that way. And if I were to put these together, now I actually have side-by-side -side number of columns equal to two. And in most situations, you want equally sized images. There, Obviously, there, maybe there's a time where you want like a really narrow, really tall image. But this is really nice for actually programmatically generating um, specific images uh, for like ggplot. And then you can add your figure captions just by adding additional um, dashes to separate out those one from the other. For those figure subcaptions, um, the way that I approach that, again, if you think about this, like with having A and B, as opposed to before we had just figure captions and it wasn't like numbered or lettered or anything, it's just saying uh, item one and item two. Subcaptions allow you to do like cars and empty cars, and it'll be uh, figure three. For this, uh, figure caption is charts. So that's why it's giving you this overall figure three of charts. And figure subcaption is what's actually giving you the A and the B that we see here at the bottom. So A is cars, B is empty cars, and then it's cut off here on the page but it's figure three, which is overall um, description of charts for that one. So again, when you can do a lot of control within those code chunk options and doing it with this hash pipe is a little bit more controlled to me as opposed to trying to do it in one line uh, across the page. And again, you can even do this with uh, your percentile based format and get very, very tight control and add like individual spacing in between and have blank spaces, even if the graphics that you're creating aren't using something like cowplot or, or patchwork to align them. And then you're adding these sub, uh, sub captions or overall figure captions um, in addition to their overall layout. So this plot layout is covered a bit more in depth if we go back to uh, section 07 visuals plotlayout.qmd. This document has a lot of different options of like doing figure captions, figure subcaptions, layout number of columns, really just to show you a few of those in action as opposed to in the slide form where we're only looking at screenshots. So we can render that and get the actual page. And now we have the proper, like here's just captions of the document. 
subcaptions giving us actually lettered or numbered versions of the images with a overall figure caption, and then doing some of the more custom, like adding spacing in between or overall uh, structuring of the, uh, the images. So that's just available in case you want to go uh, a bit further with like how you control th those layouts. Again, for someone who had asked earlier about uh, overall structure of kind of arbitrary content, so you can imagine like uh, lists or paragraphs of text as well as images. This layout number of column equals two also works for text. So this um, this pandoctive here has two columns. It's got list one with a bunch of list items, list two with a bunch of list items, and then it ends the pandoctive. By putting those together, I now get a left and a right column, essentially like with, obviously you could use the dot columns syntax, but uh, you can put together images and in, in text this way. Um, so for journal articles, if you wanna customize the facets that you're doing, um, I don't actually have this in the presentation, but on quarto.org, not Quora, Quarto, there we go. So part of the benefit of Quora.org, it has these nice um, subcap. Let's do this. So figure subcaption is how we're actually creating those. And we can go, this is on the uh, Quora website, go to authoring figures, uh, subfigures. Caption location. So doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm just trying to find this for you. And if I can't, it's a good question to tag me on online. So yeah, I'm not sure about changing. I know there's an option for it. I'm just not thinking of the top of my head, um, but that's a good question that I'll write down. So Hannah, I'm gonna grab your question and put it in my notes for later. Um, and I'll, I'll tweet that out or something to see if I can actually grab um, your ask. Copy that. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. All right. So you can do this for text as well as for images. You can kind of put uh, images and text together or overall just structure the text that you're working with. So you can imagine I have like uh, some bullet points and then I have a long paragraph immediately after that that I'm laying out with like a column structure. And I can do that exactly as you'd imagine. There's the uh, items on the left and then all the text on the right. So you can, again, typeset these documents in, in an efficient way without having to do weird things in different formats. The other option, and this is awkward because again, I'm in a presentation and I don't think, it, yeah, it's not gonna do much customization, but grid layout is one more option. Let's see if I can, yeah, we're gonna try the grid layout as well. Grid layout is something more specific to CSS. It's not really something you can um, do across format, but it really lets you dive super deep into layout structuring of documents. So we're gonna try uh, the grid layout here. So we're gonna go G columns. So let's go to our studio cloud. Uh, oh, not that one, the visuals. The part that I'm looking for here, go to quarter.org, grid, grid layout. So grid layout basically allows you to think of your page in units of 12, basically like 12 wide. And you can do these dot G call four and G call eight. The only reason I bring this up, again, it's very specific to CSS and it only works in HTML, but it allows you to do uh, very creative things with like tables and text and images all together and control their layout. So if you get into that situation and you get frustrated by some of the other options, CSS grid and using this column layout is an option for you. Now, most of those were focused on like typesetting images or text in just like individual parts at one time. 
Uh, another option is what is called article layout that overall structures uh, kind of the entire section as opposed to just the images. These might be things like limit to the column body like you normally saw with just the center portion or an outset where it goes out to the left or to the right or span the entire page or go into the margin. So these are again gonna be classes that are applied with Pandoc divs. So I can use a Pandoc div take this content and it will escape larger than the overall document. It will go a bit farther into the right-hand margin or completely uh, uh, take up the margin, for example. This is, again, it's not really possible to show on a presentation without screenshots because the presentation is always 100% width, but we can look at uh, the plots section. So we go to plots.qmd. And if I render this, we're going to look at what that looks like. And it has uh, some of the other sections for the layout. So more traditionally, you have the body, which is like the actual width across here. So it's just taking up essentially 100% of the body, but it's you know not taking up the whole page. You know, I'm just zoomed in where it's showing part of it. And a normal graphic will just stay within that range. You know, it's not going to go outside of the body of the text. But I can make it fill the entire width and do things like figure dash width or figure height and customize the sizing of images and force it to take up 100% of the image. I can throw it into an aside or into the margin. So we can actually embed a tiny graphic next to some text. Or I can do what's more called like overflow content. And this is where we're actually using those uh, body um, classes like body outset right uh, in addition with figure width to force it into the margin or to force it even farther. And there's all these different uh, subclasses that allow you to really control like how far to the left, how far to the right do you want it to go? Um, or do you want it to take up like the entire uh, screen on the left or the entire screen on the right? So this is kind of a forced together example of like, you're not necessarily going to do all these different layouts in one document, but you can imagine that there are times where you really want an image to be full width and go into the margin or other times where you just want it to be constrained to the, to the body of the uh, document. So this uh, overall, the plots.qmd within the visual section of the workshop uh, gives you all of that available. Yes, so a good question about hiding the hashtag lines. So I'm doing echo equals fenced on all of my code. If I did echo equals false and I were to render it, it's actually not gonna show any of the code um, or it would show only the code and not, uh, not the fence portion. So if I go back to, well, these are all echo equals true, but so echo equals true will show the code. Echo equals fenced will show the code and the curly brackets and the hash pipe. Um, echo equals false will hide the code. So that will allow you to control showing either the whole thing, um, showing just the code or showing no code just by changing the false, true, uh, or fenced options within the echo. So echo equals false. Good question. Now for ggplot2, if we think about it, um, number one, I'm using the Palmer penguins package, which is a common one for examples. It's a cute example with these penguins that we'll be using. I'm using ggplot and removing all of the NAs from the data set. I'm not really concerned about like what the uh, code is to create these, but it's from the Palmer penguins website. I'm more interested in controlling how this image is presented through Quarto. So by default, it looks pretty good. It kind of like fit it on the page. It made it wider than it is tall. And just by printing it, I get a nice looking image that's appropriately sized. But I can control all these components about the image uh, through the code chunk options. So I can constrain it to be very small on height. So a figure height of about two inches. Obviously this doesn't look very good, um, but maybe for another graphic or if the DPI were smaller, this would allow me to fit like two images on the page. 
Um, but if I were to make it even taller, like on a linear document, I could make it fill up more of the vertical part of the page. But you can control this with things like figure dash height or figure dash width to control the height and width of your images. Now, if I were to do figure dot height uh, equal four, this is more appropriate. The size looks good. And by increasing the DPI, I've made the image appear a little bit better and also shrunk down the text a little bit. So this is not too big for the image. It's appropriately sized for this presentation. Now, increasing the DPI or the dots per inch, this does uh, make the image larger on disk in terms of it's like a, a megabyte as opposed to 400 kilobytes or something like that. And you don't necessarily want to go like 2,000 or 3,000 DPI. For most situations, uh, you know, 300 to 600 is appropriate, but you can go higher than that if needed. Another example is if I make the image really big, and again, on a presentation, it's really constraining it to fit into what's available, so it's not running off the page. But you can see how everything is shrunken down because I've made the image bigger and increased the DPI, and then the Quarto presentation has had to respect that and shrink down the image uh, overall to fit in this range. Then you can combine height and width to overall control the sizing of your document. So again, we're not using GG Save. This is just you know applying the customization to the image itself, um, and then doing things like controlling the DPI as well uh, with with Knitter. But you can combine height and width and DPI, and all these options are controlled via the chunk options with a figure dash uh, you know appendix to the front. So you can kind of search for fig, dash, and then there's all these different options of the customizations you can do. You can also control the alignment. So you can imagine that if you had um, this wide image, rather than forcing it to the left, maybe it looks better in the center of the page. Again, by using fig and then something behind it, figure dash align here we can make it left or right or center aligned on the page. And that will allow everything to uh, appear more appropriately uh, for your document. The last part I wanna cover in terms of graphics before we get to tables is that you can also embed interactive graphics. So HTML widgets in R. Um, what is the size for, oh, good question. So there's a question, what is the size of the whole slide? Um, these slides are 1,600 by 900 um, pixels. Um, so the slides themselves, you're thinking of like, these are in inches is what these uh, dimensions are. So when you do something that's larger than the actual slide, it's going to shrink down the image. Um, for the workshop components, for like the plot layout and some of the other stuff that's here with figure layout, uh, those you could actually customize them to actually go beyond what's available just in a presentation. Uh, for interactive graphics, like uh, this HTML widget, which is um, leaflet, you can actually control those in a similar way um, in terms of controlling the size of the overall presentation. But just note that there's this interactivity available um, in, in R through HTML widgets in addition to observable JS. As far as observable JS, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but again, you can essentially create like on the fly interactive graph graphics, uh, and they follow a similar uh, grammar of graphics um, that uh, ggplot does. So it's a new syntax, it's a new language in terms of JavaScript, but writing it is going to feel fairly similar to the code that you would have written with ggplot uh, in some ways. The last example I want to cover with, with graphics and interactivity is from ggiraf. And this is one of my favorite because it lets you um, essentially take a ggplot and make it interactive. So again, I'm not too worried about showing the code here. I just wanted to include it so you could see for the future. But this allows you to have like hover text that applies across graphics. So I have graphic one and graphic two, and you can hover over things. And like here in Texas, I live kind of down here in, in Bexar County or Bear County, right there in San Antonio. 
And when you're moving back and forth between uh, these graphics, there's also um, the ability to move across the two graphics with GGRF. Madeline had a good question about aspect ratio. Yes, so if I were to go in here and go fig dash, you can see all the different things that are available. So figure dot aspect ratio, which allows you to do figure width and then uh, set the aspect ratio for height and width, as well as things like figure column, DPI, format, height, all these different figure options that are available. Um, question from Raha with HTML from our markdown, there was a limit to how many interactive plots you could have. Um, I don't know of like an upper limit on that. Part of it is that as you embed data in terms of like JavaScript like this or SVGs are literally embedding uh, some data or JavaScript libraries or additional things into the HTML. Uh, if you're using the same data set multiple times, some of those can actually conflict with each other. Um, so I don't necessarily know of any constraints that Cordo has per se. Uh, but some of the JavaScript interactivity might have constraints where they don't play nicely, uh, regardless of format. But if you do have like a reproducible example, Raha, I'd love to hear that on the uh, as an issue on Cordo in case there is something that's uh, unexpected. The last part of this section is covering more about, about tables in terms of uh, there's a lot of ways to make tables in R. There's some good questions earlier about like, using um, different formats for like PDF and HTML and, and working with it. And I'm gonna talk about a few different table making packages and, and how they work. So GT is one of my favorites. Um, GT extras is actually a package I wrote that extends GT for including graphics. The big part of GT is that it's essentially like a grammar of tables, uh, just like ggplot is a grammar of graphics for creating plots. GT tries to apply a really good syntax to creating uh, tables um, with a consistent and expected user interface. You will st typically talk, uh, start with a data frame, a table or data frame, pass that into GT, and then you can create HTML, LaTeX, or rich text format as the output from that. When I say a grammar of tables, um, what I really mean is that all these different parts are, are defined. And you could um, you could actually like indicate with R functions and GT functions to apply different customization to those. So the title, the subtitle, labels, different cell values, all these different components you can change within GT. A basic GT table is very easy to create in terms of you take some data and then pass it into GT. And then you can take additional uh, like options to like customize the sizing or the font sizing across all of them. Pause for a second. Question from Nick. Uh, if some data are embedded for interactive figures in your HTML, um, is that able to be accessed? So yes, in theory, anytime you're using uh, JavaScript and embedding data into the content, the data is available. Uh, you can't really hide it. Um, so if you imagine like going to like 538 has an example of an interactive table and you can actually see the data being loaded behind the scenes. I would generally say that like when you're working with graphics, you're typically working with um, summary level data. Um, and so you're not as concerned with people finding like the exact values because you're not attaching like a username to it or anything. It's just data. And honestly, like for a lot of things, even with static graphics, you can still identify, oh, this, this data value is, is found, uh, even if it's not interactive. So for uh, GT extension packages, again, uh, GT extras is one I wrote that does a lot of like theming and inline plotting. And then GT summary is an amazing package for descriptive statistics or statistical summaries of models in addition to traditional uh, GT tables. So GT summaries has a lot of applications within uh, medicine and specifically like R in medicine. And it comes with some clinical trial data, even in the package that we can work with. First off, like when we create uh, GT summaries, you might notice syntax like this, take a data frame, create a table summary, group it by treatment, and then add p-values. 
And this will actually do like statistical tests. It will break it up by treatment in terms of drug A and drug B. Those are the two treatments. And then it gives you all these characteristics like age and grade of the tumors, and then p-values to see if they were significant according to uh, Wilcoxon rank sum test and a Pearson's chi-square. Um, so it can do a lot for like statistical summaries of data as your descriptive statistics as well. A very, very good package. Um, the other part I'll say about GT summary is that it actually wraps several R packages. So in most situations, it should be able to write out to Word and PDF and HTML within Cordo and outside of Cordo. Um, so it's, it's a good package for generating these um, medical summaries or descriptive statistics that you need uh, within medicine. For GT extras, um, what I'm doing here is taking a data frame, grouping it by species and sex, and then creating what are called list columns of data. So when we look here, we see things like this column actually has 73 values in it, and this column has 73 values in it, and then some of the other ones have fewer values by that group. This is essentially like embedding the data within each of those rows. So when I create a graphic, I can create like a summary uh, distribution of that data. So with the singular values, they're using those as like the average of the bill length or the average of the mass. But then I also have a graphic, in this case, a density plot of the entire distribution for um, male and female species of different animals. So I have the male and the female representation of the sex, as well as the different species here with the summary statistics uh, embedded in there. GT summary actually wraps part of GT extras for some of this functionality. So you can do this in GT extras and GT, GT alone, or actually apply these additionally to uh, GT summary tables uh, for Daniel Solberg's package. Lastly, I'll just say that like uh, GT extras also allows you to do kind of stylized um, data journalism tables that embed things like inline graphics um, and colors. So for this example of recreating uh, a graphic from uh, the German political elections this past year, and that was done with really only one line of code. Take a GT or one additional line of code, take a GT table of this data frame, and then do a, uh, a plot dot graphic and add it to that. And that will add this dot and then a bar chart below it that's based off the number of seats that were won. So there's a lot of graphics and things you can combine and then also use those within Quarto. I've included a couple examples um, for GT summary and doing those within QMD as well as PDF and other formats. Again, part of what GT summary provides is um, let's go to the 07 static. So these static HTML, PDF, and otherwise, um, I've included examples so you can render those out and see that they do render out to PDF normally. So I would expect like the table to look like this uh, from, uh, from GT summary. When you create those summary statistics, it'll actually create a PDF table, or it could also work for um, HTML look at that in the web browser. They do look a bit different in terms of what they look like, um, but you can create these nice looking tables in, in either format. So we're gonna take another short break and then wrap up by talking about static documents. Uh, we've got about 46 minutes left before the workshop is over. Uh, again, if you do want to go through like the hands-on material, I've really been trying to cover just like, here's the core concepts so that you're presented with some of them and then giving you this material to try out after the fact. With a lot of the workshops that I've done, um, you know, doing it all at once, you know, you, you play around with it, but then you forget. Providing these as take-home examples is kind of my goal for not only showing you how to do it, but also providing you examples that you can work with after the workshop is over. But we're gonna take a short break. So we'll come back in about six minutes and then close with static documents. I'll stay around. Uh, I'm gonna turn my camera off and get some water real quick. Uh, but if you do have questions, I'm happy to answer some of those and I'll still be here. A good question for uh, vignette building. 
So right now, CRAN does not, not have Quarto available for, um, and I don't think Bioconductor does either for building vignettes. Part of the benefit and the reason like we're still maintaining our markdown uh, because there's so many different R specific things that it does. You could imagine that trying to do all of that with Quarto would require rebuilding entire um, R specific ecosystems uh, within Quarto. And the value add for doing some of that is, is low when the ecosystem is really well established. The areas where our markdown was kind of um, more friction heavy was in this like single source publishing or just consistency between things that weren't uh, artificially constrained like CRAN. Um, so CRAN very specifically has opinionated defaults that they want to receive, and there are limitations to the types of PDF and HTML that they will take. So while in theory, you could create the type of content with Quarto, you're definitely not going to be able to use the full extent of Quarto uh, within CRAN. So for now, definitely you're going to stick to using uh, our markdown for vignette building and documentation for packages. But great question. We're going to take about a five minute break here. All right, uh, we are going to jump back into it now and close out the last 40 minutes or so with static Quarto documents. Um, again, I'm very focused on HTML. I think that there's this um, drive that I think that moving to HTML and kind of motivating groups to move to HTML is very powerful for uh, both open data science, open kind of computing, uh, better accessibility, and a lot of other benefits. I'm totally aware that uh, Word and PDF are very, very common across the world in academia and in, in medicine. Um, but as much as we can kind of advocate for using HTML as a default, um, that's a much better world for a lot of people to work in. Um, so I'm going to focus on HTML, but again, a lot of the content that we cover here um, is also applicable to PDF. I'm trying to focus on features that are cross compatible. So even if you learn a lot of things that are HTML only, um, for Quarto specific stuff, that can apply to PDF as well. Again, for some of your older R Markdown documents or when you're trying to convert, generally static documents like HTML and PDF are very easy to transfer directly to Quarto. You can just take an existing R Markdown try rendering with Quarto and see what happens. And most times it'll actually come out looking, uh, looking really good. Again, the main difference here is that uh, difference between the format versus output in HTML document versus HTML, or in this case, uh, PDF document versus PDF. The old R Markdown, we've already kind of shown that in terms of uh, taking old content, you can render it via the Quarto command line interface or change the uh, file to be .qmd. For me, like a static document, this is most of what I create outside of like maybe presentations. I do a lot of internal presentations and training where I actually write presentations to do those. But a static document is really the daily driver where it has like, you know, table of contents, there's figure, there's code, other things, and it's, it's a linear document. It's also nice for things like just a scratch pad or even a final output for your team, as well as like a lab notebook or uh, notes on the experiments that you're running. As far as table of contents, part of what that provides as a benefit is structuring your document. So while um, headers can actually physically separate out a document, um, table of contents actually allow you to navigate between them quickly and have an outline or this table of contents that floats with the content and you can move through it. By default, the table of contents is level three headers and above, so like level one, two, and three headers. But you can also customize this to be more exclusive or more inclusive on the depth of table of contents that it picks up. Um, I'm going to show a quick example and see. So here on this page, um, it, literally what it says on this page, these are the different uh, table of contents. And you can see that as I scroll through the page, um, the table of contents floats with it. So I can move down to the instructor, the overview, um, or go all the way up to the top. 
and go back to the schedule and move quickly through the document in that way. Uh, so that's that's a benefit of what the table of contents provides is not only do you separate sections where it's like, okay, this is the start of a new section, start of a new section, but I can link to this one, like actually give a direct link to this part of the page or uh, navigate through the table of contents. Uh, we talked a bit about tab sets in terms of switching between columns. Um, so I'll probably skip through, I think some of this is repeating. So for footnotes, that's that's a good part. Um, footnotes we talked about inside the presentation. And if I show, let's do this. Apologies. Do rstd.io, let's start Cordell, okay. I'm going to show off uh, one part of this. Apologies. I just want to make sure I show this aspect getting started with Cordo. Apologies, I'm bouncing back. I just realized that the iframe is not showing. So that's unfortunate. But for uh, footnotes, citations, or um, other things like that, you can take some text and then use this syntax to add a footnote to it. So this um, upwards a block and then uh, an open and closing square bracket. And that allows you to add a quick footnote to something uh, where it's you know more specific to that and allows you to add footnotes just to a specific word and say like, here's some more information about it. In HTML, when you do that, it's actually going to show you a, um, a hover text in terms of you can hover over the final output and it will show it uh, within presentations or PDF. It will just create a, a footnote at the end of the document or an endnote at the end of the document. An additional part that you can use with like static documents is what are called cross references. In this case, um, I can add details about an image and then link to it later. So by adding this ID or this cross reference, in this case, like fig.glamour or fig.howard, um, I can use those to link to uh, it later on in the presentation or in the slides. So there would be, I can actually use this syntax, like copy this into the document and then link back to that exact figure and move back and forth between the document in addition to just the table of contents that I was working with. For the references that we wrote, um, you can you know, ho hover over or mouse over the citations and footnotes and you'll see a pop-up and you can control this behavior through the YAML header. So again, sub options, it's like, do I want citations to hover yes or no? Do I want footnotes to hover yes or no? So for this, you know, I say like, for example, did you know that Howard is a dog? And then add this footnote that says specifically he's a Boston Terrier, although sometimes he acts like a cat. And then if I look at this inside a rendered document, if I hover over that, it gives me the hoverable um, footnote. And he is definitely a cat. And then I can actually navigate back and forth uh, with the footnotes that are at the end of the page and it will take me back to number one, that footnote. So, you know, obviously this is a constrained example, but they are useful for adding additional context or citations out to a URL or anything like that. Uh, just additional details that you want to share uh, about your information. Get out of here. For code, this is again going back to again some good questions we had. How do I show or hide code? So um, at the entire document level, I could say within the YAML header, oh, go back, let's do code. Uh, within the YAML header, format is equal to HTML, execute echo equals false. And that will basically say for the entire document, turn off code echoing or don't show any code. I can still at the individual code chunk or code block level say echo equals true and show the code I want to um, only with some of them showing. But I don't have to show all of the code for everything if I don't want to. So you can balance these back and forth, like turn on uh, code echo equals true, and then turn it off for individual chunks or vice versa. There's also some additional features for what are called like code folding or code summary. 
Code folding allows you to uh, fold the code behind a details tag so that you can basically uh, turn it on or turn it off at the user level. So it's tip, you know, defaulting to hidden, but they can open it up or close it. And again, you can do this at the individual code block level as well. There's always kind of this balance between doing it at the uh, YAML for the entire document or at an individual code blocks. If I do something like this, it adds on uh, this kind of option to hide all code, show all code, or do things like view the source. Um, and that gives the user the ability to actually display or hide code interactively. So maybe you default to hiding the code, but for data scientists who are looking at it, they can open up and be like, oh, this is how they did it. They were using this type of graphic and I learned something. But for your business users or physicians you're working with, maybe they just wanna see the results and they don't really care how you got there in terms of the code. They just trust you that you're using the code to create it. So you can balance that in terms of showing, hiding code, or interactively allowing the user to make that decision. That other option in terms of the source was part of code tools as well. And I can, again, say like uh, source is equal to true. So make it where you can view the source code that created the document, uh, or make it where you can have a caption or toggling on and off the code. There's a lot of different customization you can do with that code tools option. For uh, source equals to true, if the user were to click on that, it will actually display the entire source code for that document um, as a pop-up page. So for this, it would actually show the document itself. And then if you click on source code, it basically puts up an iframe and allows you to scroll through the source code for the entire document. And that would show you like the actual markdown in addition to uh, our code that you're seeing there. For examples like today, where I've got you know, 15 different documents, maybe I don't want to show individuals, I just want to send them to GitHub or a source repository. Uh, you can also say, here's the source. Go to github.com and look at this, uh, this page. Uh, so at Cordo Dev, this page actually builds the index for um, how to build the homepage. And it links out to there as opposed to embedding a really, really, really long source code into the document alone. So we can look at this real quick and go to our Studio Cloud, where again, we're on 04 static now. On Penguin Report, I'm just kind of combining uh, a few different things. We can actually turn uh, code tools true. And let's render this real quick. So I'm taking a document with a table of contents and, and just kind of trying to show uh, how that looks throughout it. So number one, I've got the code here and I can look at the source code for this entire document. Even though it's got a little bit of code, it's mostly showing all the markdown and other customization I've done. But you can see how it's embedded as an iframe on top of the graphic. I have a floating table of contents. So as I navigate, I can say like, well, I only care about the modeling section. I just wanna see the summary table. Okay, everything was significant uh, for these and here's the R squared values for the relationships. And the wrap up says, this is an example, but now I want to go back up and understand what was the statistics for the body weight. And you can navigate between the document. So in a relatively simple and nice looking document, it's got a lot of details with the YAML header, embedding the source code and providing a nice table of contents that allows you to navigate through that. As far as moving forward with more of the code, you can also change the code highlighting. There's a lot of code highlighting options that are linked to here. So maybe rather than just hiding it, you want them to appear better. So I can change the highlighting style. So like for my editor that I use personally uh, on our studio, I do, I really like the Dracula theme that gives me this nice contrast and a dark mode theme. And then you can also change like the border color to be dark green or white to contrast against that. You can change it to be more of like a GitHub style um, and go for that. And again, change the border color and make it have a different background. And you're changing the, the colors of like overall how the code appears as opposed to um, just the syntax highlighting. 
another nice part with both Cordo and our markdown, this is not necessarily specific to uh, Cordo, but the downlet R package allows for syntax highlighting and automatic linking of R code. Now, downlet with um, our markdown was really only possible via package down. So like when you did package documentation, you could link to source code. Cordo brings it into the default YAML, and you can actually do what's called code link equals true. And that will allow you to, whenever you're writing R code, it will, again, uh, give you uh, specific sections of where you can click on the R code and it takes you to the code documentation. So a lot of nice stuff there. Uh, I'm going to close out with uh, some information about journal articles and then take uh, open questions for the last section as we close out for the day. But for journal articles, um, so Porto does have the ability to write out to many different journal formats, such as ACSM, PLOS, ACS, Journal Statistical Sciences, Elsevier, and many others. So what this allows you to do is, again, you don't have to write any LaTeX, but you would actually use these um, formats, and you could just bring those in, use a template, and then write everything by uh, working with the article templates themselves. Behind the scenes, these templates are tech files or LaTeX, but you don't necessarily have to um, write all that by hand. If you did have some things that you're applying, you can bring in templates or partials uh, that you want to. Um, and especially for doing things like adding author and affiliations, it's got this rich ability within the YAML to add all that so that when you put it at the top of your documentation, uh, the journal articles will appear appropriately formatted for, for that journal specifically. There's a lot more formats that we want to add over time. Um, and we definitely want to hear from y'all in terms of if there's specific uh, journal formats that you want to see, um, please reach out and post those on issues on Quarto journals. Um, that we want to make sure that we're basically creating the journal formats that, that y'all need for your, for your daily work. Uh, I also want to make sure that, you know, as we kind of wrap up and then go to open questions that, uh, you know, like the same team that works on Quarto also works on our markdown. So you might recognize the names like Yi Wei or JJ or Kristoff. Um, these are people who've been in our studio for a long time working on our markdown. Carlos and Charles are newer to the team, but they've been with us for quite a while as well. And they're working more exclusively on Quarto. Uh, but these are the same teams that work on Knitter and Quarto and our markdown. So again, we're not dropping support for our markdown, just you know, a lot of the newer features are going into Quarto rather than building additional R markdown extension packages. As a summary in terms of like what's going on here uh, with Quarto, like there's this benefits of batteries included and in sharing syntax across the different output types and languages. Again, choosing your own editor. And if you're collaborating, people can use their own data science languages. We're building a lot more of our materials into or newer features into Quarto. For the content from today, we have um, full workshop materials at this short link, or um, for the RStudio Cloud materials, I'll drop these into the chat. Copy that. This is the RStudio Cloud link with all of the workshop materials available uh, if you don't want to install anything. Quarto.org, I'll just give another kind of shout out to that in terms of it's an amazing amount of documentation. Um, two parts that I would suggest is for the guide, think about what is the format you're trying to do. So like if you're trying to work with static documents, there's all sorts of different subsections for the specific formats. Authoring covers most of the markdown syntax and Pandoc and Quarto syntax that you'll need. And then computations goes over things like using R. Specifically to writing like journal articles or scholarly writing, there is this other section for cross-references and citations and footnotes, lots of use there that's beneficial. And lastly, the search is actually really good. So for example, like if I want to do expression, uh, we can find this and find our studio and actually get things about the knitter engine and the expression syntax is there. So even though this is kind of like a very niche element, like being able to get there quickly from the search bar. And if I search for like um, 
chunk options, it'll break these up by sections. So you can see first it does like using R and talk about that, then execution options and all the places it finds using in R Studio, and it breaks it up into these sections for when you're searching. So don't don't sleep on the search function. It's it's actually very very powerful. Uh, for these last 15 minutes or so, I'm actually going to see if we can open up uh, for audio based questions. And I think uh, I think Emily is still around. If you could open up or help with audio. People can now unmute themselves. Perfect. Cool. So I'm going to keep uh, I'm going to reshare the slides, but I'll answer kind of open questions at this point. Is there an R command R get Cordo version to highlight which version of Cordo is used? Session info. Uh, yes, thank you for the kind words. For Jeremy, I have an open feature request on session info. So if you want to pile on to that and <laughs> upvote it, I was asking for it to be added. Um, I had a, a short helper function that I wrote that was returning Cordo version. But if you want to thumbs up that or uh, add some more context, this is the issue to follow it on session info. For the Cordo R package, there's one way. So Cordo path tells you where Cordo is. Um, or you could say something like system uh, Cordo, sorry, Cordo version system. And that will actually return uh, like the Cordo versions. So you could have that inside the body of a document, make a system call like that. And then lastly, um, this is a bit more hacky, so I don't necessarily always want to recommend it. But uh, inside any HTML document, if you inspect the behind the scenes and look at the head, it'll tell you what version of Cordo was used to generate that document. So that's one way of checking it after the fact if you forgot to do it. But good, good question. Uh, for converting Sharingan presentations to Cordo, do you have any suggestions? The biggest thing is I was a very much Sharingan power user, and I, I truly loved Sharingan. Like I was a big fan of it. Um, I very quickly, you know, started enjoying uh, using uh, Reveal JS. Um, because it worked a little bit better with our studio and there was just more features built into Cordo as opposed to, again, with Sharingan, you were relying on Sharingan and Sharingan extension packages and not all of our markdown worked there. You can keep using Sharingan. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you did want to, you know, work with um, Reveal.js, like for some of the materials that I have here, like intro to Cordo, um, writing these presentations is very similar to Sharingan. The biggest difference is that you're separating sides with um, headers as opposed to dash, dash, dash syntax. So where uh, Sharingan used three dashes to indicate this is a, uh, a new separator, uh, Cordo is kind of relying on headers. That being said, let's go here to a Cordo presentation. Test, create that. Uh, number one, you'll see that it has the visual editor mode that's only possible with Cordo presentations. Well, let's go back to source. You can still use dashes to separate slides and um, or you can use level one or level two headers. So you can try just rendering your existing Sharingan presentations over. Some of them will work, but there's some Sharingan specific syntax that you'll need to translate into Cordo. Specific page breaks in the HTML document. Yeah, so first off, the good question. We are working on the page down equivalent of HTML. Um, that is going to be a way of actually doing paginated HTML as like a first class thing, as opposed to kind of hacky uh, doing it. Um, but for the quarter documentation, I want to say, I've got too many things open now. I want to say there's a page break um, yeah, so this is more focused on um, PDF and, and Word in terms of it's more applicable there. 
but in HTML, it does this page break after CSS. I'm not super familiar with how that actually works in practice. Uh, because again, like an HTML document is not really paginated, but you could separate out your content that way. Um, but this page break short code and Jonathan, I'll drop this into the chat. Uh, Rebecca, great question. So part of, there was a very intentional decision in, in discussion internally with like book down conversion and other things like that. And part of the, Part of the decision not to kind of provide a translator is because some of that is so custom that it would actually be more annoying to kind of have this thing do something automated and then you're not sure where certain things didn't come over because you could imagine that bookdown uses quite a bit of syntax that's specific to bookdown but also does things with like html and other parts that don't translate well via our code what i will say is that um if you go to quarto.org or there's actually a book down to Quarto book, Nicholas Tierney, I think. Now I'm literally just trying to, yeah, okay. I got that right. So number one, for the project books, creating a book, uh, this way, like if you just took your dot RMDs from a book down and then put them in here as chapters, you could probably convert your book down uh, over exceptionally quickly. The part that would take more time is any of the customization you did um, that was hyper specific to book down. But like you're still using this idea of like chapters that are each their own dot RMD or dot QMD. And the gallery has some examples of books. So there's a number of books that we've converted over with uh, hands-on programming or other things, both in R and Python that have been conversions. And like Hadley is working on like R packages. I believe he's doing Quarto now for uh, R packages and R for data science, or at least we've, we've converted those over as examples. And it's got source code as well as the published version. Now, all that being said, uh, Nicholas Tierney is a great human being and actually has written out a their notes on changing from R Markdown book down to Quarto. So in this, and it's a not super long, but it just talks about like, what is the differences? What does it do? And then moving from R Markdown to Quarto. Um, so in terms of like, he wrote some little things about like doing some of this programmatically. Again, I can't promise that everything's gonna work out perfectly, but the core difference is that you have a book down.yaml that needs to become a Quarto.yaml. And Quarto.yaml is going to control overall the structure of your website or book or anything else. Um, so remove that. And then he's got some additional building and talking about like, here's where the errors were and how he changed the metadata and things like that. So this is a great resource uh, for kind of understanding some of the basics, but overall, the gallery shows you some working books and how they approached it and they look really nice. Or the actual documentation on Quarto.org books talks about like how you need to structure it. Absolutely. Thanks for a great question. All right. I'll stick around for some more questions. I know we're we're losing some folks as we get closer to 6 p.m. for me or even later, I'm sure, for people on the East Coast or elsewhere. Um, but thank you all so much for hanging out for almost three and a half hours, I guess, three, three hours and 20 minutes or so. Um, I'll again stick around at least for the next 10 or 15 minutes if needed for questions. Um, but if you have any other questions, I would say there's a few places to get help. Um, so Quarto Discussions, if you go to Quarto.org help, uh, Quarto Discussions is a way to ask questions directly to the dev team, um, or on Twitter, and I'm going to make the, uh, decision to pull up Twitter live, which is never a great choice, but, uh, hashtag Quarto pub is what I'm trying to promote as a good, uh, catch-all for, um, the Quarto resources. Um, and then you can see all sorts of things that people are sharing. But thank you all so much for your time. Um, I hope you enjoyed the R for Medicine conference. 
And uh, thank you all for hanging around with me and hanging out. All right, thanks everyone for the kind words. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Good to see you here. Uh, it's been a while, I think, since I've talked to you, Rebecca, but uh, good to virtually see you and thank you all. All right, perfect. And Emily, I think we are wrapping up. I'm not seeing any more questions, but uh, seeing some very kind thank yous and appreciate y'all's time for hanging out and for the kind words. Awesome. Thanks, Emily.